All right, welcome. There might be collateral tonight. We are reading collateral and I sprung this on these actors and their game. So just look at these awesome people, how they're willing to just jump in and do their craft with, you know, hire these people, they're amazing people. <laughs> and now you'll get to know a tiny bit about them and maybe a little bit after, but I'll go around that my, Brady Bunch here. And so Vicki, tell them who you are and where they can find you. Hi, I'm Vicki Dykes. Uh, I'm from Central Alberta. I'm an actress. And tonight I will be reading Max and also an agent later in the movie. <laughs> and none of them knew which roles they were going to read until like a minute before going live right now. <laughs> and so... And some of them have never heard of this movie, never seen the script, so they don't even know what they signed up for. So isn't that awesome? I mean, it's not awesome for them. It's not usually the way we do it. We usually do last minute, but not this bad. So they're <laughs> awesome. Morgan, tell me. Hi, I'm Morgan, and as always, excited to be here. We're excited to have you so much. Thank you all. Uh, Heather Lee Cameron. Hi, my name is Heather Lee Cameron. I'm an actor, I'm a writer, I'm a creator, and, I, and I'm a family history research student from Lethbridge, Alberta. Tonight I'll be reading Annie, Felix, and Female Criminalist. Yeah. And hey, Petra Stedman. Hello, and welcome to Whose Lightness Is It Anyway? Table Read Tuesday edition. We're very glad you could join us. The roles are made up and the casting doesn't matter. So um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I will be reading a bunch of characters tonight and uh, probably tackling some rest, resting the rest of the action description read from Jacob's cold dead fingers after I, you know, take them out and <laughs> take them. Out. I'll, st I'll stuff them in the trunk. I won't kill them. I'll just stuff them in the trunk during the intermission. It's fine. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Join us. Come along for the journey. Come along for the ride. So. All right. And with that, we will. Share our script and begin. Yeah. All righty, Collateral, written by Stuart Beatty. Revised draft by Frank Darabont and the current version by Michael Mann. Of course, as always, we're doing this for educational purposes. And check out all of these revisions. Wow. And I just watched it with, along with the movie earlier. And even with all these revisions, and you can tell this is a shooting script, the movie is still different. So just shows how they can change. There you go. But we'll go and start here with a fade in. Tradition. Hello, Michael Mann and Frank Darabont. Pretty good uh, pedigree on the writers. So that's not bad. Yep, yep, yep. And I know you guys haven't seen the movie. Right now it's on Netflix. So if you guys have Netflix after this, uh, if you are interested in it, then go check it out. It's only there till I think the end of this month, end of uh, November, 2022. Um, then I'm sure it'll be somewhere in its other places. But uh, Vicki, where did you watch it? Sorry, I did it when you're taking a drink and you're on mute. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, my my husband found it. Um, I, I oh guess he streamed. I don't know. <laughs> okay, gotcha. The tech whiz took care of it. Got it. All right. Um, then let's begin. Fade in. Interior. Bradley Terminal Blur's Day. Slide past a 400 millimeter lens, then entering a plane of focus is Vincent. He walks towards us, an arriving passenger, suit, shirt, no tie, sunglasses, an expensive briefcase, say confident executive traveler. The suit's custom made, but not domestic. His hair and shades are current, but it would be difficult to describe his identifying specifics. Gray suit, white shirt, medium height, and that's the idea. Close behind Vincent, over his left shoulder, walking through milling travelers towards the distant wall of metal and glass, sunlight streaming at him. Another businessman, suit, blonde crew cut, walks to, to camera. Same sunlight, but it hits from the side. His trajectory is from the left. His eye line is slightly right. Just now he looks down at the ticket in his hand. Over Vincent's left shoulder, right now something catches Vincent's eye and the two men bump into each other, a two shot. You okay? Oh, sorry, that's people's lines. You okay? Sorry. Vincent puts down his briefcase. The man has a similar briefcase. 
Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, mate. Enjoy LA. Vincent grabs the briefcase of the man with the North London working class accent and continues toward the exit. Was it an accident? Was it a brush pass? The man's accent signifies nothing to us except one thing, foreign origin. Vincent approaches until he's in extreme close up. Can you overshot, overhead shot Vincent up from the bottom of the frame, departs across the floor with the yellow tile until we lose him into the million hundreds of Angelinos heading out of the greater LA and in 18 million people. Credit sequence. Images wipe across the screen, kinetic and abstract, floating in a dreamlike slow-mo. Shades of yellow, ribbons of silver, shimmers of chrome. Headlights sweeping past, flaring to white, brake lights flashing, halting red, reflections of overhead fluorescence, flowing like liquid along windshield glass. Sounds are dreamlike and abstract, reverberating and disor discordant, I don't know, bouncing off concrete walls. Cars, doors opening and closing, brakes, a babble of multilingual crosstalk, racing forms, a Farsi newspaper, African hands on a Blackberry, Max's hands to do the New York Times crossword. A West African speaks French into a cell phone, Metallica in a headset, hip hot, Nortrino, mechanics hands change tires, replace air cleaners close on the hood, interior taxi dispatch, LA day. Orange and yellow Ford Crown Victorias are wiping screen. We find ourselves in a busy garage at chain shifts, a balletic convergence of arriving and departing cars. One door is flung open. Interior, one cab, Max's hands. Enter. They wipe the seats with a paper towel and 409, a DMV license fitted into a small Lexan holder. On it is a picture of Max. Lights being checked, indicators, hazards, switches, similar to a pilot doing the aircraft checklist, fast. All fine. Reveal now Max's briefcase. He opens it, preparing for his workday. CD caddy of personal mixes goes on a visor. Spreadsheet peeks out of worn Mercedes S500 brochure, clipped open. A submarine sandwich from Subway. Long lens, other cabbies, other faces load in. Southern California diversity, some un- Shaven, swapping stories, counting cash. One stands on the passenger seat and shout over the roof to his pal. Spills his coffee, couldn't care less. Not Max. His cab is fly. Among the cabbies, he is GQ. And his car horn blare. Ad lib banter. Cabbies shout. Max gets behind the wheel, closes the door. Interior cab day. And wham, the noise evaporates. Welcome silence. Max takes a moment to savor it. He starts the engine. Rap music blares from the radio. Max turns it off. He dumps a CD into the changer. Mozart Sonata fills the cab. From the open briefcase, Max also pulls out one last thing, a tattered postcard, which depicts the whitest sand and the bluest sea you can imagine, a dream place, an endorphin releasing groove, limitless horizon. It's the Maldives Islands in the Indian Ocean. Max slips the postcard under the rubber band on the visor, he can see it whenever he wants to, but not now. He flips the visor up, puts the car in gear, and pulls out. Exterior LA downtown, Max's cab, late day, northbound on the 405 or Harbor Freeway. The on-ramp the, the, to the east, 105. It is all magical in the light. Max's cab rocketing along circular ramps of complexity of five traffic streams. Interior cab, harsh reality intrudes. Max is driving a young professional coupled with carry-on bags, having a heated argument about, let me see. It's always you. Why is everything always directed at you? Everything is not always about me. He was being sarcastic and he goddamn well know it. I'm sorry. I didn't hear it that way. Oh, bullshit. What about the dig about my makeover? What do you want me to do? Punch the guy out? I work with him. And you, you're perfectly capable of taking care of your own. You know, last time I checked, you were sleeping with me. So unless you want to start fucking him, I suggest you take care of it. Max endures it silently, invisible as furniture. He doesn't exist as far as his passengers are concerned. Interior cab late day. As Max drops off an elderly Asian couple in Little Saigon, up ahead he sees a cluster of Chinese gangbangers in their early 20s wearing cheap suits, white shirts and no ties. Some guy gets pushed to the ground, punched and kicked while four or five watch, amused. Max's first instinct. 
Hey, leave up on him, man. One gang member, eating takeout with chopsticks here, turns and sees Max. Say what? What are you looking at? He throws his food container. Another throws a beer bottle. Max hits the accelerator as the bottle bounces off the rear windshield. Exterior interior cab, gas station, late day. By the freeway, Mexican murals are coated with a patina of corrosion from the fumes. We find Max cleaning Chinese takeout off his cab with water, a water hose while the gas pump clicks off. The attendant, known for five years, finishes a taco. My apologies, that's me. Um, how did you get the chop suey all over the cab? I didn't. The cab got in a fight with a gang of Chinese cholos. There's been sprouts by the passenger door. Max hangs the nozzle back, gets in the car. Max slips his credit card into the briefcase. We glimpse the Mercedes S500 catalog again. And Max flips the visor down, staring at the island, soothed by the blue. We're seeing the most private of Max's rituals the one he doesn't share with anybody. Now he starts hustling for calls by posting himself in a nearby zone. See Max work the computer. He bids and gets himself the next load. Interior cab, magic hour, superior court building. Max presumably has dropped off a load in front. He fills out his trip sheet. A pedestrian businessman asks for directions to LAX. Max ad libs, directing him to the people mover. Yellow cylindrical stairs. A pretty young woman descends into the interior lobby. Max finishes his notation. The young woman detours through the media and the rush crowd, rush hour crowd, while taking rapid fire into a cell phone. Starts towards Max's cab, waving at it. Max doesn't see her, starts to pull away. She gives up, turns toward a green city cab behind her, but it just picks up a load. Then Max catches sight of her, red tail lights. She turns and starts for the cab. We see Max regard her in the rearview mirror. He ejects a CD and loads a different one. Addendum, while, while dial for Annie action while Annie's on the cell phone, an unheard legal assistant transcriber. I need it transcribed. Off of what? Off of the line sheets. Why? Because I think it's him on there and the gold Lexus on the cell. If it is, he's enhanceable because of priors in the late eighties. What about tomorrow afternoon? Interior, exterior interior cab. The woman, Annie Farrell, enters the cab. Everything about her says serious professional, from the suit to her briefcase and purse. Still on her cell, her attention is focused on the call. No, the transcriptions need to be done by 7 a.m., period, okay? How are you doing? Uh, where to? Downtown, 312 North Spring Street. Takes Sepulveda to Slauson to La Brea, La Brea North to 6th into downtown. Max pulls away from the curb and starts the meter and turns left. So you'll be up late. I'm pulling an all-nighter too. Save the tears. She ends the call, starts to check her voicemail on her phone. Max's eyes in the rearview mirror. I'll take 105 East and up the 110. It's faster. What? 105 to the 110 is faster. 110 turns into a parking lot around USC. This late, the 110 is moving, but Ella Gria, north of Santa Monica, is jammed. 110 north of the 10, you get people going to Pasadena and they drive slow. That's why I jump off at Grand. But hey, surface streets is cool. That's what you want, that's what we do. Annie looks up for the first time skeptically. Are we taking bets? What if you're wrong? Your ride is free. Huh. You got yourself a deal. Exterior Olympic Boulevard dusk tonight. Max's cab maneuvers easily through the light traffic past golf driving ranges. Interior cab dusk tonight. Annie glasses up from her illegal brief, noticing the lack of traffic. Interior cab dusk tonight. Annie glances up from the legal brief. Oh, noticing the lack of traffic again. Oh, go ahead, say it. Go ahead. Lucky with the lights. You weren't lucky with the lights. What you were was right. I was wrong. Max. She sets the briefcase aside, eyes tired anyway. She notices the music playing faintly up front, 
box air on a G-string. You mind turning this up? Max doesn't mind at all. He tweaks the volume up, and he leans her head back to listen and closes her eyes. You like Bach? I used to play this piece in high school. Let me guess. Woodwinds? Vi uh, viola. I never had the lungs for wind instruments. <laughs> Could have fooled me. The way you were unloading into that cell phone? <laughs> Different instruments. You know, if only you'd listen to me, we'd be all bogged down in traffic right now and you would have made me an extra five bucks. Yeah? Oh, keep it. Buy yourself something. Go wild. A gentleman. I thought chivalry was a necessary casualty of gender politics. Oh, not a big thing, you know? How many cabbies get you into an argument to save you money? Well, there were two of us. I killed the other guy. I, I don't like competition. She's charmed by his deadpan. You take pride in being the best at what you do? This? Oh, oh this is temporary. You know, pays the bills. I fill in with this. I, I will be the best at what I do, but that's something else. What else? I'm setting up something. Like, tell me. A limo company I'm putting together. Island limousines. An island on wheels. So I'm part-timing until I get delivery. Benzes off, leases, work up my client list, step up, all that. An uncomfortable beat. It turns the conversation back to her. You like being a lawyer? You psychic? Well, I'm starting uh, an 800 hotline. Caught your phone call. And even if I hadn't, there's the dark pinstripe. Elegant, not too hip, which rules out advertising. Plus, a top drawer briefcase that you live out of. Purse looks like a bodega. Bodega. <laughs> Bottega. Uh, a guy gets in my cab with a machete. I figure he's a sushi chef. You, Clarence Darrow. <laughs> and he can't help laughing. Uh, not quite. He worked defense. I'm a prosecutor. Big case? Yeah. Exterior federal building. Downtown. Dusk. Max's cab slides into the curb. Beat. Still a lot of pedestrian and car traffic, people heading home for the night. Interior cab, Annie's. Smile fades as she gazes up at her building. Some anxiety comes back. You got us here fast. She digs in her purse for the fare. You never answered my question. You like what you do? Yeah. But not right now. No, I do. Like, I can't wait. I love standing up in that courtroom. At the same time, I always get this clenched up thing the night before the first day. Clenched up? Oh. I think I'm going to lose. I think I suck. I think my case sucks. I haven't prepared enough. My exhibits aren't in order. People are going to figure out that I don't know what I'm doing. And I've had this charade going on for years. I represent the Department of Justice of the United States government, and my opening statement is going to fall flat at the really important point, and the jury's going to laugh at me. Then I cry, I don't throw up. A lot of people throw up. And I have a strong stomach. Then I get it together and rewrite my opening statement, work the exhibits for the rest of the night. That's my routine. In the morning, it starts. I'm fine. Max is, Max is focused on her eyes. You need a vacation. I just had a vacation on the Harbor Freeway. She takes money out of her purse. No, not in a cab. Uh, you need your head straight. Got to get your unified self up. Get harmonic, you know? When was the last time you took a break? I take a little, little ones all the time. How often? A dozen times a day. He flips the visor down, revealing the postcard of white beaches, clear green water, the first time he's shared this with anybody. Maldives Islands. It gets heavy. I take five. I go there. On impulse, he slips the postcard free and offers it to her. No, I couldn't take that. I couldn't. 
Yes, you could. You need it more than I do. It helps, I promise. She accepts the postcard, surprised and touched. Her gaze lingers on his for a moment. She holds it. Wow. Thanks for everything, Max. Sure thing. She gets out of the cab, starts to walk away, but turns back, ducking into the cab's window, looking a bit flustered. She pulls a business card and offers it to him. In case you ever, I don't know, want to start an investigation of a Fortune 500 company or argue cab routes or something. And with that, she goes toward the three assistants waiting for her outside the revolving door. Max is left stunned, somewhat stunned, holding her card. He glances down at it. Annie Farrell, Assistant United States Attorney Criminal Division, Central District of California. Meanwhile, interior federal building garage door. A hand punches a sequence of numbers into a key bed. The, the garage is visible beyond the lock and locks. We see it is Vincent who walks into the still interior staircase from the garage. Interior federal building, Vincent Dusk emerges from the interior staircase into the lobby in his good suit with his the expensive briefcase. Casually, he glances to his right. We don't know why. Over Vincent in front of him is a guard station and a row of turn table, what? Turbrels, I don't, that require an identity card. Tumbrils. Okay, tumbrils that require, I'll say turnstiles, that require an identity card and not trigger an alarm. Vincent produces his card, scans it across the top. The indicator goes green. Vincent slips the card into his briefcase and walks through toward the, the bank of elevators. However, he doesn't take an elevator. He walks past them towards the escalator down to the street. Why did he walk into, through and out of the lobby of the building? Frontal close, Vincent, and pan right with him as he and we start a descent on the escalator from the stone foyer to the street level. Past Vincent's head, Riding the up escalator is Annie Farrell and the group of law lawyers. Vincent looks at her appreciatively, then away. Exterior federal building, Vincent exits and approaches us, an arm down to include a yellow top of Max's cab. Max still holds Annie's business card, marveling at it and her from the front. Hello. Uh, yeah. And Max can't hide his eyeline and interest. Let's go to, you free or? Vincent starts towards another cab pulling up. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. Vincent gets in. Where to? 452 South Union Street. Interior cab Max pulls out, starts the meter. How long you think uh, this will take? 14 minutes. 14, not 15, not 13. Two minutes to get on to the 101, transition to the 110 to the 10, and exit to Normandy is four minutes. North on Normandy is five minutes. Two minutes to South Union, because there's road work. 13 plus one for shit happens. Vincent checks his watch. Mind if I time you? What if I get it? What do I get if you're wrong? A free ride? An apology. Max heads for the 100 on ramp. I already offered up the free ride today. Do? Some girl. Did you ask her out? Vincent's read Max's mind. Max hadn't thought it through that far. Now that he does, reality sinks in. Annie's out of his league and he knows it. Gone forever, Max jams her card under the rubber hand on the visor. Exterior 6th Street Bridge over 110 night. Max's cab zooms across, heading out of downtown. Interior cab, Vincent, Max changes the subject. First time in LA? No, to tell you the truth, whenever I'm here, I can't wait to leave. Too sprawled out, disconnected, you know? But that's me. You like it here? It's home. 17 million people. This was a country. It would be the 15th biggest economy in the world, but nobody knows each other too impersonal but that's just me you know i read about this guy gets on the mta here and dies six hours he's riding a subway before anybody notices 
the corpse doing laps around LA, people on and off, sitting next to him. Nobody notices. I see your point. Yeah. Vincent gla glances around the cab. Cleanest cab I've ever been in. Your regular ride? Yeah. I share it with the day shift guy. For nights? Well, people are more relaxed, you know? Less stress, less traffic, better tips. You get benefits? Like sick leave? Retirement, health and welfare. Oh, it's not that kind of job. Start a union. Me, specifically? Why not? Last thing I need is a reason to keep driving a cab. It's temporary. I'm filling in, you know, while this other thing I'm putting together is shaping up. How long have you been driving? Twelve years. Hardly temporary. Really? What else are you putting together? Max hesitates. He's not as secure as he was with Annie. I don't talk about it. No offense, but, you know. I'm taken. Talkers and doers like you, I like doers. Exterior South Union Street apartment building night. A rundown quasi-deserted area. Alienation in the twilight. A lonely tenant watches the city from an open window. Max's cab pulls to the curb. Interior cab Vincent closes his briefcase, checks his watch. 14 minutes. And you're good. Lucky with the lights. Yeah, sure. You probably know the light schedules too. Listen, I'm in town on a real estate deal, a closing. One night, I got five stops to make, collect signatures, see some friends. Then I got a 6 a.m. out of LAX. Why don't you hang with me for the night? I'm not a hired cat car. It's against regs. Regulations? These guys don't pay you sick leave. How much you put, pull down a shift? Mm, 250, 400. I'll make it 600. Plus an extra hundred if you get me to LAX and I don't have to run for the plane. Vincent draws crisp hundred dollar bills from his briefcase, fans them like a magic trick. Meanwhile, a car pulls up behind the double parked Max. Vincent steals a glimpse of his PC, sees a real estate prospect this looking display. Take a chance. Man, I don't know. Yes, you do. Yeah, okay. Vincent smiles, gives him a firm handshake. Cool, we got a deal. Here's 300 down, what's your name? Max. Max, I'm Vincent. Vincent gets out, Max calls after him. I can't double park here. I'll meet you in the alley behind the building. Understood, Vincent steps into the building foyer while Max puts the car in gear. Exterior alley night and pulls into the alley behind the apartment building. Interior cab Max brings the car to a stop and notices Vincent's briefcase lying on the back seat. A trusting soul, Max smiles. Definitely not from around here. He kills the engine, silence. There is a noticeable lack of city noise, distant talk radio, Spanish gospel from the Baptist church, an occasional car passes the mouth of the alley. Max trades Mozart for Beethoven. Max checks his watch dinner time. He turns to his battered briefcase on the passenger seat. It is filled with carefully arranged items, napkins in the pockets, utensils in the pen holders, foil packs of mayo and mustard and Thousand Island dressing, 1.5 liter plastic bottle of vitamin mineral water, a well-worn Mercedes brochure for the S500, a spreadsheet like a handwritten business plan, a large submarine sandwich wrapped in two halves, neat notepads, everything in methodical order. Exterior interior apartment building, very close past Vincent, climbing the stairs with palm trees and a downtown behind. Interior cab Max spreads Thousand Island on the sandwich. He glances up at the visor. He tilts it down, peering at Annie's business card, wondering what to do. Will he call her? He sits a moment, fighting a wave of sadness, unhappy with himself, with his life, his place in the world. Interior cab Max raises the sandwich to take a bite. From the floor up past Max, the steering wheel, VFX green screen, up through the wind windshield is a twinkle of the stars in the night sky. Suddenly, 
A dark shape from above blacks out the sky. It descends toward us as Max takes a bite. Wham! Something huge rocks the cab on its axles. Glass rains down. A headlight explodes. A windshield fractures. Max bounces off the ceiling. His submarine deconstructs all over the interior. He's, his coffee spills. And then the abrupt, stunning silence. What hit him? An earthquake? Max takes a dazed beat. He peers at the windshield. A dead face of a fat man stares at him. Max recoils and ye yell. A scramble from the cab. Heart pounding. Exterior alley from above, cab night, a corpse is angled across part of his roof and windshield in a bathrobe. The shards of the window glass from upstairs everywhere. It makes a halo around the cab. Max is stunned. He looks to see where the body came from. Max's POV, third story, South Union location. A window on the top floor is broken out. A white current curtain flaps in the breeze. Low angle, CMS Max turns. Vincent has entered the alley and now stops. Max's first thought. This passenger will think Max ran into a, this guy. He, he, he fell on my cab. You always stutter? Well, yeah, yeah. A guy fell on my motherfucking cab from up there. Max looks up, points again, as if Vincent might have missed it the first time. Vincent's focus hasn't left Max. I think he's dead. Taken two forty fives and did a high dive onto his head. It's a good guess. Max stares at Vincent. It's sinking in. Vincent, meanwhile, has to make his decision about Max. Kill him and find another, or you you killed him? No. I I shot him. The bullets and the fall killed him. A frozen beat. Everything's out in the open. Max realizes he's in trouble. He backs away thinking escape. And like lightning, Vincent's 45 HK is in his hand to Max. The 45 caliber bore is the diameter of the Spring Street tunnel. Red light, green light, light's red. Max freezes. You can run, but you'll die tired. Max nods, shakily raises his hands. Put down your hands. Are you cool? Say I am cool. You are cool. No, say you are cool. I am, I'm cool. Vincent decides. The gun disappears back into Vincent's waistband. Okay, help me out here. With what? El Gorda decided to get some air and not take the stairs. So we go to plan B, pop the trunk. My trunk? I can't leave him here, so unless you want him riding up front with you and given the hygiene and his fingers let go. Max reluctantly pops the trunk, circles to the front of the car. Vincent reaches over the hood, grabs the corpse by the bathrobe lapels, heaves the body into this sitting position. Gonna roll him off the hood. Always lift your legs. I don't think I can do this. He's only a dead guy. On three. Uno, dos, three. He rolls the corpse off the hood, grimacing. Max gets a firm grip under the arms. Vincent gets the legs. Got it? Yeah. They start shuffling toward the trunk. Suddenly, Max lets out a yell, almost dropping his end. Oh! His hand moved. His goddamn hand twitched. It's a spasm, Jesus. Don't be such a girl. Angle from inside the trunk as they leave the body inside, pausing to catch their breath. Never heard of a treadmill? He slams the trunk, shutting us into darkness. Exterior cab night, and we find Max is frozen like a statue while Vincent is dousing the hood with Max's 1.5 liter bottle of drinking water. Six liters of blood on the average, Angelino. He's got to dump all his on your cab. Okay, that's good enough. Vincent heads for the car, notices Max's feet are frozen to the concrete. Um, uh, look, why don't you, like, let's take the cab? Take the cab? Yeah, I, I, I'll chill. 
you know, uh, and they don't check. You know, they don't. Uh, they don't know who's driving these things. You, me. And you promise you'll never tell anybody, right? Get in the fucking car. Max does. Vincent gets into the back seat. Interior cab Max behind the wheel turns a key. The engine grinds. He tries again, more grinding. Can we leave the scene of the crime now, please? I'm trying. He turns ignition again. Grind, grind. Vincent's getting steamed. Max. It's not me. Grind, grind. The engine is already on. Put the little pointer on the letter D. D stands for drive. Max pulls out of the alley. Exterior street as Max's cab. You're, you're making me nervous. I'm making you nervous. I'm the one on a schedule. Accelerates away, disappearing. An another car appears. Exterior Union Street. It cruises down the street and heads and stops in front of the apartment building. Ray Fanning emerges from the car, head edged, edged hair and earrings, sports clothes, and a salesman or player or a dealer. 40s, a face with character and some miles and something insistent about his intent. He heads towards the edge entry gate, rings the buzzer, waits a moment, rings again, nothing. Plus he looks like he could kick your butt if he wanted to. He pulls a thin plastic car from his inner pocket of his jacket, jimmies the door lock. Interior apartment building courtyard, third floor fanning night. Approaches across the balcony walkway against the junky palms in downtown skyscape. He knocks on the door, causing the door to swing in slightly. He glances down and sees the lock was pulled. Tensing, he fades to one side. His hand goes to his holster at his hip. He draws a Beretta, reaches out and pushes the door all the way open. Interior, apartment, no, no, nothing, night. A dark shambles, old takeout, a TV. Fanny enters cautiously, alert for the slightest movement or sound. Ramon? Estás festando con una chica? Are you partying with your girl? Sorry. Nothing. But thank you for the transition. Fanning cautiously enters the bedroom, worried now. Reemerges. Nothing. Interior apartment Fanning carefully negotiates the corner and slides along the wall to see the broken window. Glass missing. He leans out. A dizzying drop. A halo of broken glass on the alley below in the center of which is a big blank spot. Crap. And he produces his police radio and we, we realize he's a cop. Interior cab traveling Max Knight. Max winds his way through the surface street, traffic in shock, sneaking anxious glasses, glances at Vincent and back. Vincent got the tablet PC from his briefcase, studying it. The silence is thick. Max's hand is shaking. He lifts it off the wheel and tries to study his fingers. Vincent diverts some attention to Max. Try deep breathing. What? Adrenaline's wearing off. You get shaky after. Some people slip into shock. It's not uncommon. Deep breathing helps. Max starts drawing in breaths, letting them out slowly. Is that better? I think so. They stop at a red light. Max glances at the passenger seat, dressing and stray pieces of lettuce and mortadella. He parks the gear shift and goes for paper towels, cleaning it up. Vincent over the tablet PC, talking to Max softly. What are you doing? Oh, it's a mess. So? Max keeps wiping as if getting the seats clean might put everything right again. Lady Macbeth, leave the seats. The light's green. We're sitting here. A car horn honks behind Max. The car whips around them to get through the intersection. Hey, who? You Me no too. longer have the cleanest cab in La La Land. You gotta live with that. Focus on the job, drive. Right, Max puts a car in a gear and proceeds. Seven, five, six, five Fountain, you know it? West Hollywood. How long you figure? Max has to force himself to concentrate. Mm. Uh, 17 minutes. 
Why? Silence from the back. Max into the rear view, realizing. Oh. Oh, no. No, you're kidding. Oh, we... I told you we had other subs to make tonight. But you said you were visiting friends. There's somebody's friends. You drive a cab, I make my rounds. We both do our jobs. You might make it through the night and come out 700 bucks ahead. I, 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 I'm not trying to piss you off, see? Okay? Uh, but I can't drive you around so you can murder people, man. That's not my job. Tonight it is. You don't get it. I, I mean it. Really, I'm not up for this. Vincent realizes Max is on the verge of panic. You're stressed. I understand that. Keep breathing. Stay calm. Max starts deep breathing again, exhaling slowly. Vincent stows the PC. Are you breathing? Yes. Good. What else calms you down? Candy, cigarettes? Breathe. Music. Play music. Max turns on the CD, soft classical. Vincent says about the music. Sorry, my screen's frozen. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll read it. Chopin, prelude, strategy. Here's the deal. Let us know what's back. Okay, got it. Uh, you were going to drive me around and never be what the wiser. But because of El Cordo's high drive, we're into plan B. Still breathing? No. We have to make the best of it. Improvise. Adapt to the environment. Darwin. Shit happens. The I Ching whatever. Roll with it. I Ching. You threw a man out a window. I didn't throw him. He fell. What did he do to you? Nothing. I only met him one time. Then how can you kill him like that? I should only kill people after I get to know them. Six billion people on the planet and get bent out of shape because one fat guy. Who? Who was he? What do you care? Ever hear of Rwanda? Rwanda, yeah. Tens of thousands killed before sundown. Nobody's killed people that fast since Hiroshima or Nagashi. Uh, Amnesty International, Oxfam or something. No. I off one Angelina. Need to throw a hissy fit. Max stops at another red light. I don't know Rwandans. You don't know the guy in the trunk either. If he makes it feel any better, he was a criminal involved in a continuing criminal enterprise. Oh, oh, that makes it okay then. Because uh, all you're doing is taking out the garbage. Something like that. What you need to remember is that nobody gets out of this alive. Even if we could quit smoking. Cut out red meat, everybody dies. Suddenly, a brilliant glare of flashing lights stabs at the cab. Max sees an LAPD cruiser behind the cab. The rooftop lights flashing. Please pull over the vehicle. Vehicle over to the curb. Max complies. A second bright beam of lights up the in interior. Two uniformed cops emerge from the patrol car, faceless, silhouettes approaching cautiously. Get rid of them. How? You're a cabbie. Talk yourself out of a ticket. The cops are now circling to either side of the cab using mag light flashlights. Vincent eases the briefcase off his lap. His hand clears his field of move movement, spread open his jacket to better reach his waistband and his HK. Please, please don't do anything. Then don't let me get concerned. You don't have the trunk space. I can't believe this. Vincent's hand reaches. Believe it. Don't. I'll, I'll talk to them. I'll talk to them. Probably married. A cop's hand descends to the driver's side window, raps loudly. 
gold wedding band catching the light as it taps on the glass. Maybe that one's got kids. Probably his wife's pregnant. I'll deal with it. Flashlight beam pops on at the driver's window. Cop number one, glaring light into Max's eyes. The second flashlight beam pops on. This is from cop number two on the passenger side, checking out Vincent in the back. Vincent smiles good naturedly. Max rolls down his window. Cop one leans down and we see his face for the first time. A clean cut blonde guy. License and registration. Max pulls them off the visor, hands them over. The cop examines them by flashlight. Pulled you over because your windshield smashed. All of this current? Yes, officer. From the other side of the cab, cop two lets out a laugh. He's playing with his flashlight beam across the seats. Mustard and mayo everywhere. Once you have a food fight in there? Max gives Vincent an I told you so look in the rearview mirror. Meanwhile, we hear dimly on the place police radio about a domestic domestic disturbance on 83rd and Hoover and some officers responding. Cop number two plays his beam across the cracked windshield and damaged hood. Faint reddish traces in the paint. His smile fades. Is that blood? Yeah, see, um, I hit a deer. A deer? Yeah, over by Slauson. A south central deer? God damn, deer jumped out in front of me. You believe that? Why are you still carrying a passenger? I was headed back to my depot, see, you know, and this, his drops on the way. Yeah, but your cab's not safe to drive. We're going to have to impound it. We need to do a vehicle inventory while we wait for the tow truck. Pop the trunk and step out of the vehicle. I'm sorry, sir. You have to phone for another cab. Is that necessary, officer? I'm just half a mile from here. I'm afraid it is. Please exit the vehicle. You too. Max hears a soft click behind him an unmistakable sound of a safety clicked off. He meets Vincent's gaze in the rearview mirror, a whisper. You open that trunk, they go inside. Behind Vincent, through the rear windshield, Max sees cop number two moving to the trunk, playing his flashlight across it, Max's mouth dry. Hey man, it's been a long day, you know? It's so slow, I pay this guy to ride so I don't get lonely. My first bear. How about a break? I'm heading to the barn anyway. Get out of the car and open the trunk. Max tosses a hopeless look into the rear view. Vincent staring at him. No mercy there. Max steps from the car. The cop escorts Max toward the rear. Vincent smoothly pulls out his HK from his waistband and emerges on the passenger side. Gun held out of sight and a heartbeat away from opening fire. A crackle of static. On the panic, a panicky voice comes over the police band. It, it, officer, I have this, okay. officer needs help. We got a man with a gun. Shots fired at 83rd and Hoover. Let's Cop go. Number, off screen, radio talk from many responding units. Get that, ba- get that cab back to your garage. The cops pile into the black and white and we're off into the night. Max and Vincent are left standing, gazing across the cab at each other. Breathe. Max starts deep breathing as they get back into the cab. Exterior hotel, penthouse, corpulent man, corpulent man at night. In an attorney's suit with rapper, rapper clients. I thought Californians exercised. Reveal Vincent looking at his PC. Vincent pulls from his briefcase, an identity card for a notary republic and a second gun, a 45 cal per ordinance backup. He moves the side, checking there's a round in the chamber. Max hears metal on metal, looks up as Vincent holsters it in a sm- the small of his back. What are you looking at? He gets out and enters the passenger seat next to Max in front. Hands on the wheel, 10 and 2. Like they taught you in driver's head. Why? Because I say so. Max grips the steering wheel. Vincent has plastic ties and proceeds quickly and efficiently 
to bind Max's hands to the steering wheel. That's a disgrace. No wonder the cops pulled you over. On the way out of the car, That's me. <laughs> Max. Max. You out there, you son of a bitch? Vincent looks to Max. Who is that? Lenny, my dispatcher. I know you're out there. Answer the goddamn call. What happens if you don't? He'll keep calling. Max. Answer! Vincent reaches across Max. He pulls the mic off the dash, holds it up to Max's mouth. Don't blow it. Max nods. Vincent thumbs the toggle. Uh, yeah, Lenny, it's me. I just got off the phone with the cops. A desk sergeant called to check you brought the cab in. Silence as Lenny waits for a reaction. Max and Vincent trade a look. Vincent shrugs, thumbs the toggle. Say something. Yeah, so? So? So aside from I hate talking to cops, they tell me you trashed the damn cab? It got crashed. I didn't. Do I care what, where, or why? You're paying for it. It was an accident. You're not liable. It was an accident. I'm not liable. Bullshit! I'm making you liable. It's coming out of your pocket. Vincent stares at Max, expecting him to respond. Tell him to stick the cab over his fat ass. I can't do that. He's the man. So what? I need the job. No, you don't. You still there? I'm talking to you, Max. Vincent abruptly abruptly puts the mic to his mouth. Thumbs the toggle. He's not paying you a damn thing. Who the hell are you? Vincent glasses up, tilts the visor down, and sees Annie's business card. Richard Ricardo, assistant U.S. attorney. A passenger in this taxi cab, and I'm reporting you to the DMV. Hey, 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 let's not get excited. Not excited? How am I supposed to not get excited listening to you try to extort a working man? You know goddamn well your collision policy and general liability umbrella would cover the damages. What are you trying to pull? The sarcastic prick? Look, I'm just trying to... to... Tell it to him. Tell him he's an asshole. Uh, You're an asshole. Tell him next time he pulls any shit, you're going to stick his yellow cab up his fat ass. Next time you pull any shit, I'm going to stick this yellow cab up your fat ass. Vincent clicks off, hangs up the mic, looks at Max. Beat. Max, taped to the steering wheel, nods. Don't wait up, hon. I got to work late. He grabs ignition keys, shuts Max's door, strolls away. Max watches in the side view mirror as Vincent vanishes into the building. Max is left alone, trapped in his own cab in the alley. Max jerks jerks and strains against the duct tape, trying to free his hands. He gives up, breathing hard. Interior hotel penthouse night. The overweight lawyer, Sylvester Clark, who we saw on Vincent's PC, separates from two girls and a second man, all watching TV to answer the phone. That's me. He identified himself? Sure, let him up. Interior lobby, Vincent, in in shades, leaves the hotel security and enters the elevator. Meanwhile, interior hotel penthouse, Sylvester Clark, crosses towards the front door. Exterior hotel alley, moving in on Max. He glances in the side view, wondering where Vincent is, straining for a glimpse. Nothing, just darkness there, mind racing. Hey, hey, over here. I'm in the cab. Hey, help. The street traffic's distance. Nobody's around. Help. God damn it. There's a man with a gun. He's going to kill people. Max thrashes wildly against the duct tape, screaming with frustration. He starts betting, headbutting the car horn. Beep, 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 beep. He raises his head, checking the street traffic. A quarter of a block away, no one on the sidewalk takes notices of Max's cab. Oh, fuck me. He shifts low on the seat, getting his knee under the dashboard. He slams his knee up, hitting the red emergency light button, concealed there. Emergency strobe lights start flashing in the front and rear of the car. And still, 
Nobody notices. God damn it, I'm flashing like a Christmas tree over here. He throws a look to the side view mirror, sweaty and tense, knowing he's out of time. The side view mirror in which we see Max's reflected eyes, seconds ticking breathlessly away as he struggles. He headbutts the horn again, beep, 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 flashers and horn. Meanwhile, the angle shifts in the mirror, leaving Max's eyes and bringing into view the building and the penthouse at the top. We see two silent muzzle flashes light up the window like flash bulbs going off, another death. Then a third flash, then nothing, lights out. Meanwhile, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. He's headbutting the horn, beep, 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 and he checks the mirror. This time when he looks, young white guys, 20 to 25, they were on the sidewalk. Now they detour into the alley, approaching the distressed cab from the back, shielding their eyes from Max's flashing lights. Oh, oh, thank God. Hey, hey man, help me out of here. Yo, what's up? I got my, my hands taped to the steering wheel here by this guy who's taped me in the car. Because he's up in the building somewhere. It's Closer now, the four are in baggy hoodies and tatted with lightning bolts on their necks, swastikas on their chest. One has a 5150 tattooed on his shaven eyebrow, police code for emotionally disturbed. You all trapped in there and crap? Yeah, and he's coming back. Oh, hurry, let me loose so I can call the cops. White guy number one nods and pulls a chrome 38 and points it at Max. Fuck that, man. Give me your wallet. The others have walked off down the alley laughing. One tosses a beer bottle that smashes. Utter disbelief from Max. Are you kidding me? I will fuck you up. Hand it over. (laughs) My hands are taped to the damn steering wheel. He takes a moment for the white guy number one to process this. He steps to the window, presses the 38 against Max's cheek. It's mm-hmm. utterly terrifying. Everything happening fast. Don't shoot me! Don't shoot me! Then get your ass up. Up, up, up. Max pulls himself up by the steering wheel, trying to get his butt off the seat to give the young man access. The white guy number one grobes for Max's back pocket, trying to get the wallet, pressing the gun to his face. The other guys down the alley turn the corner. White guy number one pulls Max's wallet from his pocket and pauses, seeing Vincent's briefcase in the back seat. He yanks the door, the back door open, grabs Vincent's briefcase too, and walks off after his friends. White guy number three and number four turn the corner. White guy number two lingers. Max still taped is shaken. He believes, he can't believe what happened. He looks through the windshield at white guy number one walking off cocky as hell and about to vanish into the night. Back of white guy number one. Yummy. White guy number one turns to see silhouette of Vincent. He raises 38 side-handed like he sees gangsters doing MTV. White guy number two joins him. That my briefcase? White guy number one approaches Vincent from the front. Number two from Vincent's left. Baby. What and what the crap else you got? He closes on Vincent with a 38 held high on the side. Vincent's left slams the number one, 38 draws and fires from the hip, pulling two runs into number one, hammers on two round, rounds to the sternum, pivots one round to the head of number two, all in 1.6 seconds. White guy number two falling backwards is dead before he hits the ground. Number one, never saw it coming. Vincent picks up the case, retrieves something from number one's pocket, puts one more in the head of number one on the way back to the cab, where Max saw it all, frozen in horror, astonished. The rear door opens. Vincent hefts his briefcase into the back seat. He gets into the front. Vincent sits for a moment, staring off, not looking at Max, maybe ready to kill him. Vincent raises something into view, Max's wallet. He tosses it into Max's lap. Vincent flicks his hand, click clack, and Reeves folding under in a dull metal razor sharp. Where's the button? Under the dash? Yeah. Vincent leans over 
and slices the plastic tie, freeing Max's hands a beat. You mind turning it off? Max doesn't move for a moment, then reaches under the dash and turns off the strobes. Interior cab, Max and Vincent traveling, night. Vincent in the back seat, just opposed to a different continuity through the side window. We see C Crenshaw Boulevard barbershops, music shops. We stopped for a light. Max is shell-shocked. Another collateral. What's that? Collateral damage. People in the wrong place at the wrong time. And you? You attract attention? Are you going to let people get killed who didn't need to be? Understand? I'm low on gas. Go in there. Exterior gas station in street taxi night pulls by. Time lapse and macro close up numbers. Race by widen. See Max filling up the taxi. Vincent is positioned off the right rear corner from where he is line of sight of everything. His effect is flat, distant. Max has witnessed violent death and the full lethal capabilities of Vincent. Neither say a word until softly. Vincent? Yes, Max. Am I collateral? Pause. A long one. I haven't decided. Max is silent, absorbing this. Vincent checks his watch. Unexpectedly, his mood changes up. But hey, new news. We are ahead of schedule. Huh? We got time to kill. You like jazz? I'm, what? Jazz. Not, not that much. Guy told me about a place off Crenshaw, Hindmar Park. All the West Coast greats played there. Dexter Gordon, Theonius Monk, Shep Baker, like that. Buy you a drink, expand your horizons. Max doesn't get Vincent's mood up change. Exterior South Union apartment building alley, crime scene, night. Cops and forensic technicians in the midst of all of this. All is Ray Fanning. He wears his badge visibly now. We find him turning to a superior. Richard Widener, 50-ish, is entering the crime scene. So this informant of yours, what's his name again? Ramon? Ramon Gallardo. Supposed to take him for a drink. I come here, find this. You've been working him? Four months. A low-level player. He's been feeding me stuff on Felix. Reyes Torrena? Forget, Felix. The feds are all over that. They don't want us anywhere near it. Since when is the LAPD working for the FEB? Besides, Ramon flew out of a window. My CI flew out of a window. He's got Felix's handprints on his butt. Yes, that makes it ours. Where's the homicide, Ray? Where is a body? All we got is glass. He spreads his hands at the alley floor in a gesture that says, show me something besides the glass. And blood. Huh? Blood, down here, in the glass. Here's some more. A female criminalist, SID, examines the alley floor with luminol and a handheld black light wand, picking out dark patterns. Small splatter patterns here, all over there. Shining flashlights pick out blood on the alley wall. Fanning steps to where the cab was parked, stands in the middle of the blank spot surrounded by the glass and points down. Ramon flew out of the window, went splat. Here's the glass, then some tires rolled over it. Oh, how does that spell homicide? Maybe he jumped. Sure, he's depressed, so he jumps out four stories out of a window onto his head. Wow, that feels better. Picks himself up, now thinks, I'll go on with the rest of my day. Uh, Ray, catch. Two uniformed cops have approached. Widener and Fanning glance up. A plainclothes cop is leaning out of Ramon's broken window, dangling a clear plastic baggie. He drops it. It comes sailing down, right into Fanning's grasp. He glances down at it, it shows to widener, tighter and wider, revealing two spent 45 caliber shell casings in the bag. 
So who's got what? Any witnesses? We've been knocking on doors. Old guy across the street lives. Or is that you? Am I one or you two? Yeah, I'm one. Sorry. Old guy across the street lives above the deli. Says he saw a cab parked here earlier tonight. There were two guys working under the hood. Description. What did he see? Kinda saw. Guys got glasses like Coke bottles. Did he see it or did his seen eye dog see it? Late model, four-door Ford, yellow or orange. Maybe it was a taxi cab. 4,000 taxis in L.A. County. What else? That's it. Uniforms go back to work. Photographer shows he doesn't know what to shoot. Meanwhile, Fanning lost in all thought. Remember fall 2001, that Bay Area deal? Oakland. Cabby dro drove around all night, killed three people. And then he flipped out and put the gun to his own head. So what? So the Oakland PD detective, what's his name, uh, never, never bought it. Why? The cabbie had no criminal record, no history of mental illness, pops three people, then himself, and the victims weren't random. Two were involved in some pharmaceutical scam. Anyway, the detective always thought there was someone else in that cab. Hmm. Interior Daniels, jazz club night. Dark and elegant in the early 60s modern jazz kind of way, with a low ceiling, small tables, leatherette booths, history soaked into the walls. A black man in his late 50s, Daniel, is playing a muted trumpet on stage with a quartet. Customers are few, clustered at small tables or at few curved leather booths. The walls are lined with great framed photos of jazz icons. At one of the tables, we find Vincent and Max. Vincent is about the music. A little 60s early Miles thing happening. I never learned to listen to jazz. You don't learn to listen any more than you learn to breathe. Open your ears. Vincent's attention focused on the music. I get a beat. I don't really hear a melody. He's off the melody, behind the notes, outside what's expected, improvising off impulse. Kind of like tonight. Like tonight? Sure. This is nothing, if not what's next right now, in the moment. There's people 10 years from now, same job, same place, same shit. Everything the same, keeping it safe. Over and over and over and over. 10 years from now, man, you don't know where you'll be. 10 minutes from now, tonight. That's what he's saying. Open your ears, you'll hear it and is dialoguing with the trumpet. The waitress arrives, an Asian woman with a tray of drinks. Another vodka tonic, hun? And one for my friend. Who's on the tenor sax? That's Daniel, baby. He's the owner. He's terrific. Would you be so kind as to invite him over after his set? I gotta buy him a drink. Sure thing, darling. Vincent gives her a radiant smile and tucks a $20 bill into her apron as she leaves. Time cut and we find Daniel sharing more than just a few drinks with Vincent and Max. The place is almost closed, just the three of them. I was a young cat back then, about 19, bussing tables right here, didn't pay but shit, but that wasn't the point. Being around the music, that was the thing, and I was. Take this one night, July 22, 1964. Who walks in? Mr. Louis Armstrong. You're kidding me. Right through those doors, the man himself. Jesus. He was in town playing two gigs a night at the Coconut Grove in the Ambassador Hotel. After his last set, decides to come down to South Central to hang with his people. That's how he was, you see? Never forgot who he was. Money, fame, all that meant nothing long as he could blow his horn. So, before you know it, he's up on that stage doing his thing. Was it great? Better than great, it had to be. Like Wenton Marsala says, it was pure spiritual essence. Louis was playing, God was smiling. You heard Armstrong play live. I've never been this jealous. You get to talk to him? Did better than that. You're muted. <laughs> You 
you were muted, but it's okay. We did it. Uh, nope. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> no. Oh my yes. Come on. Fell on this place back then. Cat named Dix Dwyer. Let it slip to Louie that I played. So Pops, he just waves me right on up. My heart about stopped. <laughs> but I got up there all the same and we played for nearly 20 minutes. Unbelievable. You hearing this? Max is drawn into the story in spite of himself. How'd you do? How do you think? You ain't shit when you're playing next to Louis Armstrong, but Dipper Mouth, he was kind. He could see me crying, beat me trying. He carried my ass as best he could. Remember what you played? Most vividly. Potato Head Blues, Sleepy Time Down South. <laughs> Then Pops laid cornet chop suey on me and left me in the dust like a whip dog. Whip dog. Whip dog on a wet night. Crowd dig it. The crowd was most kind. I was born in 1945, but that was the moment of my conception right there. Right there in the used to be crowded room. Daniel picks up the bottle to freshen up their drinks. Crowd's not here now. Ah, oh, jazz ain't the draw it used to be. But the place looks great. Only because I got the wherewithal to finance keeping it up on my own. Great story. I'll tell the folks in uh, Glucan and Bogotega that story. And Daniel's hand freezes just as he's about to pour. He glances up mm -hmm. at Vincent. You know people in Culiacan and Bogota? Great, so. Max is glancing from one to the other, unsure what's going on realizing it isn't good and here i thought you were such a cool guy i am a cool guy with a job i was hired to do you know how it is there's a genuine regret in vincent's tone max feels his heart pounding but manages to keep his voice steady let him go vincent i'm working here you're the one who keeps talking about going with the flow you like the man you like the way he plays. How about a little jazz, huh? Improvisation? That's funny from you. Okay, some jazz for the jazz man. How's this? I'll ask a question. What question? Jazz question. You get it right, we roll. You disappear tonight. You don't go home, you don't pack a bag, you leave town. And nobody, I mean nobody, ever hears from you or sees from you again. How do I know you'll keep your word? I never lie. Ask Max. Max, have I lied? Daniel looks to Max, hope, fear, and desperation in the older man's face. No, no, he hasn't lied. Daniel absorbs this, looks back to Vincent. Means you're a man who lives on reputation. I will take your word and I will give you mine. If I walk out of here today, I will go so far away, it'd be just like I was dead. Vincent nods. We have a deal. He eases something from his waistband. Max knows. His heart is in his throat. And one more thing. Those guys and their man here. What's his name? Felix? Yeah. Tell them, if by some chance I get this wrong, you tell them I had to. They laid a grant of immunity on me. It was flip and play ball or go back inside, and I ain't going back inside. Sure. Daniel pours himself a drink. He lifts his shot glass, and hand trembling, trembling slightly, knocks it back, sets the glass down. Lay it on. It's symbol. What was Louis's first musical instrument? I know all there is to know about Louis. Then let's have it. Daniel hesitates. It was a trumpet, wasn't it? Wasn't it a trumpet? Daniel shakes his head. Cornet. Bought it from a New Orleans pawn shop when he was a kid. <sighs> Cost him $5. Got a $2 advance on his salary from a fine Jewish family he worked for. Saved up the rest. A frozen moment. An endless pause. Max not even breathing. Staring at Vincent. Waiting. A beat of regret. And Vincent's gun comes up so fast, Max didn't even see it. Three small pops, a different gun, 22 caliber Redger with a thick silent barrel, three small holes and Daniel's head falls forward. Vincent catches it and arranges Daniel's arms so that Daniel's head rests on them as if he's taking a nap. 
and Vincent did it gently, almost regretfully. A red mist of blood swirls in the air. Max is stunned beyond words and, and powder burned at such close range. Silence now. No one noticed. The waitress was in the kitchen softly. Tin horn, cost him a dime. Rode the junk wagon and played for the neighborhood. People sold them stuff, rags, bottles, whatever. Max sits frozen, unable to move. Exterior street outside jazz club night, and they exit the club. Vincent heads for the cab, turns and sees Max standing there. Let's go. No. What do you mean, no? I'm done. Find another cab. Max turns, walking away. Vincent blinks at him, almost laughs. Max? Leave me alone. I'm collateral anyway, so do it and stop making me a part of this. I don't want to know you. Vincent grabs the back of his collar, slams him against the wall. Max's neck is a centimeter from breaking. Their faces are inches apart. I'm not playing. You played him, man. He got the answer right. Would you have let him go? The question hangs in the air. Before Vincent can answer, the dispatch radio crackles. Max? Max, pick up, dipshits. What is with this guy? Max. Vincent spins Max, controls him, and as he propels him to the cab, slams him against the fender. Vincent releases him, points at him. Don't move. He reaches into the cab, pulls out the radio mic, clicks it on. You hassling my man again? Who are you? Same fare you talked to last time. What are you guys, taking an all-night tour? We're gay lovers. What's it to you? Nothing? Aside from every night, Max's mother driving me crazy. I'm dancing on a rainbow. May he come on the line, please? Hang on. Carefully. Max takes the hand mic, clicks it on. Yeah? Your mother's calling me every ten minutes. Why didn't he show? Are you all right? Where are you? Show for what? Tell her... I can't make it tonight, okay? What am I related to you? Tell her yourself. Then he clicks off dead air. Show up for what? She's in the hospital. You visit every night? Yeah. What difference does it make? Because if you don't show, it breaks the routine. So? So people start looking for you. This cab, this is not good. No, I can't take you to see my mother. Since when was any of this negotiable? Interior hospital entrance night. Stark corridor. This is where we're taking our intermission. So if you guys need a drink, a rest, a breather, etc., now's the time.
So do you got you guys? I found out that these, even though these are live stream, I can edit out the intermissions. Sometimes we have fun and talk and this and that. Do you guys think we should edit them out, um, or do you guys of the live versions? We usually la edit them out of the edit ones, but I found out we can do it on the live versions too. Do you guys think we should edit them out most of the time, know. or just leave them? At one point, we were also thinking about. Um, possibly if we got everybody's demo reels or whatever playing like somebody else's demo reel during that time oh you know what i did Funded. message did you, did you get my message about the demo reel i requested some things because i'm trying to build my demo reel i did and i meant to download the videos so i can get them to you but haven't yet and uh, can you help me with work. another like i want a couple more clips and i know the ones i want can you help me with a couple more of them i'll message you later yeah i'll 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 get you the whole entire videos of which ones you want so you can find and take all that you want. Because I think that using things from here would be okay. Oh, I, I think it'll be great. Like my room's in the background and I really don't have a choice. But yeah, I'm as I told good. you, Heather, you also want to make one that is original characters because if you want to submit to agents and managers, they'll only accept original material. What, for voice or video? Voice. I, I'm talking about video. So I'm using TRT material for video because it's something. We'll talk about it later. Yeah, we can talk about it later. Okay. He was right. bringing it up. That's why I was bringing it up. Yep, <sighs> I, I did bring up demo reels. All right, I guess we should sorry. get back. No, sorry. That's good. But what do you guys think? You think we should do demo reels during this point? You think we should delete the live ones, just leave them? Any opinions on this from this? Well, program? anything's got to be better than the old one I had because I didn't even know anything until Morgan told me mine wasn't very good. <laughs> I, I, again, I know there might be other reasons that Morgan will bring up to you about why you shouldn't use so these. So Morgan's ones, a very but... gifted soul and a very helpful I didn't soul. Say that it wasn't good. Yes. I just but... said it's professionally we can make it better, and I offered to help you put it together. That'd be great. And I, I do like a lot of your performances here. Cause sometimes when I've seen your other ones that you do for a reel, um, understandably, it feels like you're trying very hard where when we do this big long reading, sometimes it's, you can tell you just relax and it comes out so nicely mm -hmm. and natural. And it's like, I've yeah. gotten better. Yeah. Oh, that's great to hear. <laughs> this is worth Especially it. Especially the last yeah. week where I wore that stupid wig. <laughs> it's fun. It's so good. Fun. But okay, I know a lot of you guys have to go early tonight, so we won't keep this going longer. So we'll get back to it. Oh yeah, Petra, thank you. Yeah. You're taking over, right? Yeah. Okay. And then I should need, am I still sharing? Do I need to share? Yeah. I'm um, sharing. Yes. Cool. I still, I still need you to, I need you to drift though. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> okay, we ready? Okay. Cut to interior hospital entrance night, stark corridors, queasy fluorescent lighting, patients and staff members. A row of injured people are seated along one wall waiting for attention. The automatic doors swing open. Vincent and Max enter, the briefcase held at Vincent's side. As they enter and proceed up the corridor. Stay three paces to in front of me and one to my left. Max, seeing the innocent people along the walls, complies. Vincent sees in the ceiling a security camera mounted in a per, in a perspex hemisphere and averts his eyes and averts his face towards Max. Flowers. Max turns, sees a row of flower bouquets at the gift counter. Waste of money. Won't mean a thing to her. Vincent pulls an arrangement, tosses the flowers to Max, pulls his wallet to pay. She carried you in her room for nine months. Interior hallway night. The elevator arrives. Max and Vincent get on. Vincent presses the button, then the doors start to close. Oh, hold, please. Vincent puts his hand out, stopping the doors. A man slides into the elevator with them. Interior of the elevator and turns around. Detective Ray Fanning. He doesn't see Max in the back corner. His back is to him. Five, uh, thanks. Vincent hits the button. The doors close. The three of them ride up in that awkward silence you only ever experience with strangers in elevators. He glances to Vincent at the control panel and nods. Having a good night? Mizo, Mizo. You? Vincent nods, making do. 
The elevator stops. Vincent and Max get off to the right. Fanning continues riding up one more floor. Interior, fifth floor, hospital corridor, elevator doors, and light. Open. Oh. Fanning gets off, turns a corner, sees a sign indicating morgue. Interior, hospital room, lower floor, Max, night, possibly include corridor. Enters with the flowers. Vincent appears behind him, hovering in the doorway, where Max moves towards the bed, where Ida Rilke lies hooked up to a heart monitor, a clear oxygen mask over her mouth. She opens her eyes. Hi, Mom. I've been calling and calling. I got caught up at work. Why couldn't you call me on the telephone? I'm lying here wondering if something horrible happened to you. I brought you flowers. What am I going to do with flowers? You're going to cheer up. How? By worrying that you spend money on things that all they're going to do is die? See? I didn't buy him. He did. Who? Who? Come in. What I got is not contagious. Why didn't you tell me we had company? And what's your name? I'm sorry. My son is Rue. No harm done, madam. She takes the flowers from Max, making a fuss over them. You paid for my flowers. They're beautiful. Max, will you introduce us? Mom, Vincent. Vincent, my mother, Ida. Vincent sets his briefcase by the door, approaches the bed, offers his hand. She takes it. He glows with charisma. I'm really happy to meet you, Miss Riker. Oh, call me Ida. To what do we owe the pleasure? Vincent sits in the chair at her bedside. Well, I was with Max when he got the call. And you came all the way here to see me? It's nothing. Tell my son you have to hold a gun to his head to get him to do anything these days. Tell me about it. Vincent leans in and helps adjust her pillows. You must be an important client of Max's. This catches Vincent slightly off guard. He glances to Max. Client. I like to think of myself as a friend. A mentor. Max never had many friends, always talking to himself in the mirror. It's unhealthy. Hey, Mom, how many times do I have to ask you not to do that? Do what? Talk about me like I'm not in the room here. What's he saying? Ida, he says he's standing right here in the room. Here. Yes, you are, honey. He's sensitive. I know. But I'm sure you're proud of him. Of course I'm proud. You know he started with nothing. Look at him today. Here, Vegas, Reno. Vincent looks at Max, squirming under the exposure. Mom, Vincent's not interested. Let's go. No, I am interested. What's your name again? Vincent. I came to see you. I saw you. You look fine. Let's go. He kisses her and wants, he's kissed her and wants to get out of there. Limousine companies. Yeah. He drives famous people around, you know. Limousine companies. What an achievement. Max heads for the door. Visit again. I'm only in town tonight. What about when you come back? Sure, I promise. Well, nice to meet you, Vincent. He turns to find Max gone. He looks down, eyes widening. So is the briefcase. Vincent have races out into interior of the hallway and spins around, frantically trying to see where Max went. Nothing but a few patients and hospital staff and a door marked stairs swinging shut at the end of the hallway. He runs in that direction. Interior hospital stairway. Vincent bursts through the door into the stairwell, hearing running footsteps below. He peers over the railing and sees Max three flights down. Max freezes, looking up, clutching the briefcase. A moment of eye contact. Stop, or I'll go back and kill her. You do her a favor. And Max keeps going, vanishing from view. Vincent takes off after him, plunging down the stairs at breakneck speed. I'll tell her the truth. Moving with Max, careening dizzily down the steps with the briefcase, hurtling from one landing to the next, footsteps echoing on concrete. Moving with Vincent, racing down the steps like a madman, yanking his H&K from under, the, from under his jacket. Exterior hospital, on rear door, night, optional. Max comes through the stairway door, racing like crazy 
along a row of huge roaring industrial washers, trying to make it to the exit door at the far end, and Vincent burst from the stairwell in pursuit, pausing to whip his H&K up in a two-handed grip, aiming down the length of the laundry room, as Max vanishes through the exit door at the far end. Exterior, hospital, on rear door, at night. Max races out. Interior, hospital, stairway, Vincent, racing down the stairs. Exterior, hospital, rear door, Vincent, burst through parking lot. Exterior, hospital, wide, Vincent, VFX. See Vincent at end of parking lot, running towards us. Pan left to Max, running up a, st uh, running up a walkway over the freeway. Exterior, pedestrian bridge, Max, runs to camera along the bridge, which we now reveal is above and over the freeway. Max runs up, exhausted. The stream of lights beneath them. Max swings the briefcase back, preparing to hurl it. Yawned. And Vincent's H and K is aimed at Max. Max looks back, sees Vincent, gun aimed at him. Red light, green light, Max. A heartbeat, a hesitation, and then bullshit. Max hurls the briefcase with all his might. Vincent watches in horror as it spins lazily through the air and crashes onto the freeway below where it's run over, flips in the air, is hit by a truck, and the tablet PC is deconstructed into useless pieces of plastic and silicone. Vincent approaches. What the fuck was that? Jazz. Max is suddenly on the ground, not knowing how he got there, about to die. Vincent above, staring at Max. You are screwing with my work. My prep was in there. I'm coming up on number four. The night is no longer young. Are we getting adversarial? Each syllable like a bullet. Should Vincent kill him? Then, almost admiring. Didn't you know you could do that? Let's see what else you can do. And he pulls Max to his feet. Cut to interior hospital morgue night. Fanning's in the cold room with a morgue attendant, which I believe is me. We've had um, three come in today, two John Doe's, maybe one's your guy. The attendant nods at the first of four plastic wrapped corpses lying on stainless steel tables. R Fanning draws the sheet back, homeless man with a beard. No, not Ramon. The attendant makes a notation on his clipboard. Fanning nods at the next corpse. Try that one. The attendant draws the sheet back. It's the younger man who mugged Max and took Vincent's briefcase. No, next. That's what's funny. These three came in within a half an hour of each other. And the kid and that last guy, number four, they were done by the same shooter. Why do you say that? Fanning gets alert. Same wound pattern. Two in the sternum, one in the head. Add this cat's tight, sh shooting tight groups. Double taps are a couple millimeters apart. Intrigued, Fanning steps back to the fourth corpse. The attendant draws the sheet back. Fanning stares down at the dead face. Instant recognition. Interior hospital hallway plus autopsy room minutes later. Fanning is on a payphone amped up talking with Richard we Widener. Widener's at home perched on the edge of the bed in a crowded bedroom overlooking MacArthur Park on palm trees and city lights rubbing the sleep from his eyes. Intercut is needed. Yeah, I'm still at MLK. The John Doe doesn't pan out. Not Ramon, but you'll never guess who else is in the meat locker. Elvis Presley? Sylvester Clark, criminal lawyer turned lawyer criminal. Sly to his clients. Including my high diving informant, Ramon, who he represented, who's still missing, both of whom were in the exotic substances business. Ramon and Sly Clark in one night? In one night. Something bad is going down, and I don't think the Phoebe know about it. Widener hangs up, hauling himself off the bed as we cut to interior Max's cab traveling, Max Knight. Max drives in self-conscious silence, feeling Vincent's gaze on the back of his neck. Limos, huh? Don't start. Vincent enters text into a cell phone or pager. Hey, I'm not the one lying to my mother. She hears what she wants to hear. I don't disillusion her. Yeah, right. Maybe she hears what you want to tell her. Vincent sends and waits. Whatever I tell her is never good enough. It's always been that way. My three older brothers, their wives made a move out of town. Vincent closes the pager herself. You're going to a place called El Rodeo. It's on Whittier Boulevard in Anaheim. Where on Whittier? Look it up. What's at El Rodeo? Just drive. 
They project onto you their flaws, what they don't like about themselves, their lives, whatever. And then they rank you instead. How do you know? I had a father like that. Mothers are worse. Mine died when I was one. What happened? He hated whatever I did. Got drunk, beat me up all the time. Then what? I killed him. I was 12. He was the first. I was the first. Oh, sorry. <laughs> he was the first. I'm kidding. He died of liver cancer. I'm sorry. No, you're not. So, driving this cab temporarily is all bullshit? It's not bullshit. 12 years is not temporary. You gotta get cash together. Insurance, bond, maintenance, tires, staff up, client list. It, it's not get the car, but asses on seats. Why not? Because island limos will be more than a ride, like a club experience, a cool groove you don't want to end, like that. So it's got to be perfect. Perfect. Uh -huh. Plus, I got bills. She's been dying of the disease since I was in high school. Exterior, El Rodeo Nightclub, Anaheim Night. Headlights pull through the jammed lot, Max's cab, and it pulls past the entrance to a parking slot near the alley. Interior, cab night. Here's good. Max backs in, cuts the engine. Vincent checks it out, concealing himself as much as possible in the shadows of the back seat. Give me your wallet. Why? Vincent snaps his fingers impatiently. Max pulls the wallet, passes it back. I'll hold it for you in case they search you. In case who searches? Vincent nods towards El Rodeo. People inside. Go in and ask for Felix. He's expecting you. Felix? Okay. What's he look like? I know. Never met him. Who is he? He's from who hired me. I don't get it. You destroyed my workups, and number four is due. What do you think? Night's over? Caught on an account, Rain? Go be me. In there. Square the backups. He'll have them on a flash drive or a CD. Why me? I can't. Why don't you go? They don't know what I look like, and I don't meet people. Like in risk management, protect anatomy, and you're not going to screw that up. How am I going to be you? Max, who's SoCal Company? Ralph SoCal? No. Ever met the owner? No. Well, I don't work for them. I work for their bosses. They don't get to meet me either. If, if I don't pull it off? They're going to kill you. You got 10 minutes. 10.01. I drive the cab to the hospital and execute your mother on the way out of town. And don't pretend to end it. And don't pretend indifference. I can't do this. You threw my PC onto the freeway. You got the balls bigger than Toledo. If I pull it off, it's going to get other people killed. Out of options, Max. Take comfort in knowing you never had a choice. Huh. How long you been doing this? Why? In case he asks. Private sector, six years. You got benefits? No, nor paid sick leave. Quit stalling. Get out of the cab. Max hesitates, opens the door, gets out. Exterior street, long lens, Max night, crossing towards the entrance. Who is this? Not Julio Iglesias. And we hear whirring. Angle pulls back. Interior surveillance location night. Reveal federal agents clustered loosely at a row of monitors in a hard location. On the monitors are multiple views of El Rodeo's exterior entrances, two ND homes. The interiors are two ND cars. One agent watches Max cross to the El Rodeo entrance. The room is littered with surveillance equipment and pizza boxes. Senior agent Frank Pedrosa, permanently agitated, stands. The camera on Max zooms in, tracking him. Exterior street outside El Rodeo. The parking lot for fixture light stand. Move closer. Reveal it's a camouflage housing holding a video surveillance camera that right now pans and zooms on Max. Um, are you Agent One? 
I know I'm fed. Oh, no, sorry. I'm <laughs> Mark the time. Interior surveillance location Pedrosa. Reacts to a soft knock on the door. Fanning and Widener are ushered in. Pedrosa glances at them, motions hang on a second as he stares at the monitor. Interior Elberdeo entrance night. Entrance does not have a crowd waiting to get in past disco bouncers. Only light traffic flows in and out, but it does have extensive security. Max, hiding his terror, steps up to the two men at the door. Yeah. Uh, hi. Hey, Paso, what's up, Holmes? Uh, I'm here to see Felix. He has something for me. Don't know no, Felix. That's it. Max failed. He won't make it past the front door. Um, say, say it's Vincent. I, I'm Vincent. The two men trade surprised looks. Suddenly cautious and respectful, they lead Max inside. Interior surveillance location, night. Pedrosa watches the group enter exit into El Rodeo, then turns to Fanning and Widener for quick introductions. Lieutenant Richard Widener, LAPD, Major Narcotics Division. Detective Ray Fanning, LAPD, Major Nar. Uh, yeah, hi, okay, Agent Frank Pedrosa. Thanks for seeing us. Yeah, you're welcome. How can I help? What's up? Why do you want to know about our case? Has there been any unusual activity tonight? As in? As in a murder or maybe murder spree in Wilshire Central? All quiet on the Western Front. Various people are asleep. Various people are not. They come and go in cars, pickups, and taxis. Other than that, we're watching air move. Your interest in our case? Fanning trades a surprised look with Widener. A taxi? Fanning gestures. Pedrosa nods okay. Fanning rushes to the monitor, sees Max cab, Max's cab peeking, from out the, peeking, peeking out from behind the corner of the building. Puts all beat to crap. Widener's fumbling on his cell phone out, already dialing. On oh, that. Oh, sorry. On that. What's the license number? Technician on the joystick pans a remote camera to the cab, pulling out his notebook and scribbling down the number. Interior El Rodeo night as Max is led into a cavernous blue Dayglow Sinaloan disco. As they move through dancers in Sinaloan style, white cowboy hats, jeans, braided keychains, endangered species cowboy boots, hot ladies in spandex, and other couture by Earl Shy. <laughs> Sorry, that's hilarious. It's little, I got it. It's painted on. That's cute. As they approach a row of booths opposite a mural of famous Corrida singers, more sophisticated security appears. Paco pats down Max. Another, Rubio, cautiously covers him. Then Max is led to a booth in which sits Felix Reyes Torreña. Felix, unlike El Rodeo's population, wears Hermes bought in Paris. Reserved elegance. Huh. I thought you'd be taller. He's not invited to sit. Anyway, I look at this. I see only one thing. I see only one thing with you here tonight. I see trouble. Gestures. Max sits. Forces himself to meet Felix's gaze. So, Vincent, explain. Meanwhile, interior surveillance location monitor night replays Max's entrance. It's enhanced and the audio is filtered, eliminating RF interference and background noise. We hear, we and they hear, don't know no Felix. I'm Vincent. The reaction in the room is electric. Did he say Vincent? El Rodeo, interior El Rodeo night. Vincent don't meet people. With Jeeves and Quilla can Bogota, maybe. But he won't talk to you. But now you are here. Okay. Why? For a moment, it looks as though Max isn't even going to get the words out. And then. I lost my stuff. Pause. Stuff? Your stuff? Yeah. I want you to listen to me real well. Special teams put together that list of needles. Needles? Fingers, informants, signal intercepts, voice recognizing software, surveillance, very expensive counter intel produced that list. An important list, wouldn't you say? And you lost it. I'm sorry. Sorry. Sorry does not put back together again, Humpty Dumpty. Max is nearly pissing himself. Do you believe in Humpty Dumpty? 
Felix makes eye contact to Paco. Paco nods. Rubio, next to him, has his hand on an SMG and moves right to get a better line of fire on Max. No. Do you believe in Santa Claus? No. Neither do I. But my children do. They are still small. But do you know who they like even better than Santa Claus? His helper, Pedro Negro. Black Peter, there's an old Mexican tale that tells of how Santa Claus got so very busy looking out for the good children that he had to hire some help to look out for the bad children. So we hired Pedro and Santa Claus gave him a list with all the names of all the bad children and Pedro would come every night to check them out. And the people with the the little kids that were misbehaving, that were not saying their prayers. Pedro would leave a little wooden donkey on their windows and he would come back. And if the children were still misbehaving, he would take them away and nobody would ever see them again. Now, if I am Santa Claus and you are Pedro, how do you think jolly old Santa Claus would feel if one day Pedro came into his office and said, I lost the list? How furious do you think Santa Claus would get? Falco's gun is visible. Safety clicks off Rubio's SMG. So tell me, Vincent, tell me what you think. I think... He can't finish. What? I think, I think you should tell the man behind me to put that gun away. What did you just say? I said, tell him to put the gun away before I take it and beat his bitch ass to death with it. Felix eases back, measuring Max. I picked up a tail. Federa? You tell me. How do I know? So I toss the list and workups to protect, in part, your Hermes fashionable, sorry ass. Felix considers Max. You think I like coming here? Like I got stupid all of an instant? Shit happens. You gotta roll with it, Darwin. I Ching has uh the fat man, the penthouse guy, the jazz man. It leaves two. Can you finish? In six years, have I ever not? Meanwhile, interior surveillance location night while the feds go ape shit at what they've been told. Meanwhile, Widener answers a cell. Are you telling me Ramon Gallardo and Sylvester Clark were murdered tonight? Both killed? Sylvester for sure. Ramon... We got another DOA, one Daniel Baker in South Central. That's three. He killed three in one night? Three what? Fed three looks at Pedrosa mutes. Three witnesses for a secret grand jury. Secret my ass. So who's left before you lose them too? Interior El Rodeo night in a carrying case in a ruggedized... PC is brought to the table. Felix turns it on, enters a password, loads, downloads two files, targets four and five into a flash drive in the USB port. The last two. Felix unplugs the flash drive and pushes it across to Max. Max takes it. Their eyes meet. Do not fail. I never do. Felix releases the flash ram. Max rises. And as a token of appreciation... I want to offer you a discount. Yeah, all my services here tonight, 25% off. 25? Hell, make it 50. Oh, <laughs> very generous. And by the way, Daniel says, said he was sorry. Felix nods. Max turns and walks out. The moment he's gone, Felix glances to Paco. They're giving him questioning looks. Go to favor. He's met me. If it begins to go wrong, close his eyes. He cannot fall into their hands. They rise. Exterior El Rodeo Max exits, taking in a deep, a deep breath of night air, stunned that he's still alive. Interior surveillance location monitors. The Fed swarm, remotely zooming and capturing images, everybody talking at once. Chaotic ad lib. 
His face. Make sure you get his face. Vincent the ghost. Too grainy. Too much noise. Plus 12 dB of gain. You get noise or you get no image. Are you getting this? Yeah. Angle shifts to fanning. Cell phone to his ear. Trying to block out the noise as... Yeah, uh-huh. African-American, medium build, dark hair. Are you sure? Meanwhile, Pedrosa has separated from the group and on both a hard line and a Nextel is speaking urgently. LA 101 to chase units. I want a three-car revolving tail on that cab. LA 102 is on him. Now, at El Rodeo, we will do a takedown of the cab with Vincent in it before he gets where he's going. Locate our witness, Peter. Yep. Wife, girlfriends, mommy, daddy, whatever. Get him evacuated. Get him safe. On the cab, the assault team, when they are in place, will do the takedown. Take do not spook him before. I want air support up and to maintain at 1,500 feet. Meanwhile. Email me his license, okay? I'll wait. Anybody else in the cab? Widener can't tell from the angle of the surveillance camera. In the street below, Max walks to the cab. Interior cab Max gets in behind the wheel, feeling limp. He lets out a slow breath, reluctantly passes the flash drive to Vincent, who already has Max's PC ripped from the dash and in the back seat. Vincent plugs the flash drive into the USB port. The icon appears. Vincent double clicks the cursor on it. Vegas odds would have compelled don't pass, bet on you walking out of there. I'm very impressed. Conti uh, continued, Vincent enters a code. He sees what he needs. Washington Boulevard, after hours dance club near Crenshaw called Fever, know it? 12 minutes. Vincent quits the flash drive, looks at Max. Max starts the car and pulls out. Interior, Max's cab, Vincent, looks at Max through the, <laughs> it's weird, like those are usually excellent things. Looks at Max through the rearview mirror. You'll be late. Jump on the freeway and get me to the 105 West. Why? Do it. Interior surveillance location night. While the feds are departing to interdict the killer before he can take their next witness, Fanning is trying to get a word in edgewise to a fast-talking Pedrosa. According to the cab company's dispatcher, this cabbie's been driving the cab for 12 years. So what? So you're telling me this cabbie walks into a phone booth and Shazam changes into a meat eater? Super assassin? What's he do? Squeeze them in between fares? No. Cab driver Max is floating down a storm drain. He is stuffed in the trunk of a cab. He's being devoured by flesh-eating Stratococcus. Fanning displays on his cell phone Max's picture from the DMV on Max's license. It's blurred, low res. The guy who walked out looks like this guy. Exterior surveillance location, rear loading dock, and coming down the steps fast, Fanning and Widener at their heels, talking over his shoulder. Because he picked a cab driver who looks like him. What's Vincent look like? Who knows? He's a ghost. Vincent's not even his name. I don't know. We do. We see private sector security working for cartel groups in Colombia, Russia, Mexico, hiring ex-special forces types, ex-KGB all the time. Guys with trigger time, skill sets, real tradescraft. Like, look like a cab driver. They near their cars. What are you going to do? Take down his ass. Save our witness. As Pedrosa and the other feds climb into a Cadillac and a Buick and a third car. What if they're wrong? The guy just identified himself as Vincent and met with the bad people. Bull crap, there's something else going on here. It's not our game. Interior Max's cab rear shot over Max Knight to the 405 south down ramp to the 105 west, plus profiles left to right and frontal driving shots of cab to an off ramp. Interior LAX parking structure, Max's cab night, Gary's airport shot. Enters and drives past cam into the interior. Is Vincent parking and leaving early? Various locations and angles inside parking structure. Max's cab drives up ramps under white strips of neon and crosses the bridge to the adjacent parking structure at the northwest corner of the parking area across from the Bradley terminal. 
interior, LAX parking, FBI Monte Carlo, dots, darts in after Max's cab, hesitates, keeps a distance, sees it's clear, then accelerates, tailing the cab. Interior, LAX parking, up ramp, Max's cab, accelerates up and up ramp. Interior, Max's cab, rooftop, Vincent has turned around in his seat and looks out the rear window. We see why the FBI couldn't follow. Interior, parking structure, FBI Monte Carlo, pulls in and stops. It's in sight, but doesn't approach the latest up ramp to the roof. Follow him up there. We blow the tail. Exterior, empty rooftop lot wide, em empty parking lot roof. Anybody tailing Vincent and Max would expose themselves right here. It's called a choke point. Interior, Max's cab, Vincent. Let's go. Max st starts towards the down ramp. Interior, parking structure, FBI Monte Carlo. LA 103 to LA 101, Pedrosa, Pedrosa, air support. LA 103 to Air 4, you still have him? Air 4 to LA 103, I lost him. You're in control, airspace. I gotta stay out until I get clearance from LAX Tower. Pedrosa. Interior Pedrosa's Buick, Pedrosa at night, listens, and then... You lost him? He can head anywhere out of LAX, north or south on the 405, east on the 105, the 110. Pedrosa's plan to intercept and take down Vincent just crashed. He rapidly recalculates. They locate Peter, yep. On with the wife. She thinks he's at fever. They called, can't get through. <coughs> well, Washington and Crenshaw, move. LA-101 to LA-103. LA-104, LA-105. Fever, after hours club on 2407 Washington, near Crenshaw. Pico Union, hit it. LA-105 to LA-101, copy that. Ariel Max's cab from inside the curve cloverleafs onto the 105-110 interchange. Interior, exterior, Max's cab under the interchange north or southbound 110. Interior, black SUV. One of Pedrosa's chase units with four SWAT types and sports clothes jams off the freeway onto an exit ramp to surface streets north on Western or north on Crenshaw. Interior, Max's cab, Max and Vincent, night are riding in pensive silence through the neon visual noise of Koreatown. What do you have called her? Who? Your lady friend, the one who gave you her business card? Or was she just being polite? I don't know. Why hold back? Why not act off your impulse? Pick up the phone. All I owe a fair is a ride, Vincent. It's not what you owe me. <laughs> Time is fleeting. Life is short. Time is luck. One day it's gone. You make it out of this alive, you should call her. That's what I think anyway. It's an important speculation from Vincent, given what's going to come later. And meanwhile, interior FBI Cadillac Pedrosa. With two or three agents in the other two cars, one checks there's a round in the chamber of his nine mil, was the silent neighborhoods pass by. Interior, S600 Mercedes, Paco, Rubio, and two other cold dead killers. Paco has a silenced nine mil with an aim point laser sight. Interior, LAPD, marked, unmarked car, fanning at the wheel, tailing the FBI cars at a distance, cross chatter, drifting from the police band. Exterior, Olympic, or, question, Max's cab, night, cruises east. Korean neon burns into the sodium lit magenta sky. The streets are empty at 4 a.m. Reflected streetlights flow up the windshield, colors kicking off dented bodywork. The streets are deserted. The, st the city seems dangerous. Max and Vincent's attention suddenly is taken by something else. Interior, Max's cab, Max and Vincent's POD, POV, three coyotes, night, separate and apart, lope, different, lope diagonally across sunset, adult males, hunting. They are indifferent to urban habitation as if they, not we, own the city. Exterior, Alexandria Street, abstract signage, becomes a frontal of Max's battered cab to camera as it turns right as interior, FBI Buick over Pedrosa and his POV through windshield night. A half block ahead, he, we, glimpsed Max's cab pulling into the fever forecourt. There. Interior, Max's cab, approaching Fever Nightclub night. There's chaotic valet parking with Bentleys and a Lambo in choice spots. 
the party till dawn crowd and in the thick of it interior fbi buick but they are preceded by a porsche suv and a limo cuts them off and tries to disembark a diva two girlfriends two guys with players heading into a club before fever heavyweight security has a fuck you attitude towards pedrosa's buick and the suv la la 105 until exterior korean mall feds night in tactical vest with car 15s you know it's supposed to be ar 15s um <laughs> Sidearms deploy. Vanity muscle undergo instant attitude change. Pedrosa ad-libs telling the diva to shut up and get back in the limo. The Max's cab has disappeared from view. Exterior front of cab fever. Pedrosa night. We get your vote. You take Vincent. Clean shots. Watch your backgrounds. Pedrosa approaching the front entrance. The non-HRT are trying with the bouncer, who in response to a request we didn't see, is trying to get a response on his radio from people in the interior, but fails as his men enter. Meanwhile, interior club fever Vincent Knight propels Max past a bar through screens of glass, frosted alcoves jammed with people. Booth towards the back. That's where he hangs, back Korean guy. Terminal acne as a youth, you go first. 15 feet in front and three to my left. Wander and innocent bystanders get the first rounds, Claire. It's all black lacquer and frosted glass. Back rooms in Korean Luxo are for karaoke or the Korean hotties who hang by a counter like a check-in area. Panels of water, panels of glass in semicircles in front of planting, some with sheets of water running down, separate the different zones. Or it's cheesy disco with flat screens playing Korean music videos and stock market quotes with out-of-date Christmas decorations and black-lit outer space murals. Visually, it's as noisy as the Korean hip-hop, which makes it impossible for anyone to hear anything. Exterior, front of Club Fever, Fanning and Widener, Night, flash their LAPD badges, brush past the doorman, proceed in, interior, fever, close, Vincent. With Max front in front and to his left, snakes through the crowd, swimming among them, scanning for Peter Yip, seeking his target in the back booths. Pedrosa and the feds enter up the stairs, staying as discreet as possible while urgent. While Pedrosa shoots looks, his POVs, feds move south along the east wall into the densest part of the club, searching for Vincent, trying to spot him before he can assassinate Peter Yip, searching for Yip as interior club entrance, Paco, Rubio, and two enter. They hang at the rear. Wait. Their job is to take out Vincent if it looks like there's if it looks like there's trouble. A double takeout because Vincent must not fall into the hands of the FBI. He knows too much. Pedrosa searches desperately for Peter Yip, his last witness to get him to safety. Fanning enters, scanning the crowd, nothing. He and Widener split up, and Vincent, deeper among the dancers, now sees distantly Peter Yip for a moment. He's located towards the back wall across the dance floor in a booth in a raised area in the semicircular room. Here with him are two young Korean girls and a heavy set rapper. The view got blocked by an African-American and Korean bodyguard in suits near the booth facing out. Behind the booth are five or six Korean gangsters, but on the dance floor itself, Vincent spots an outer perimeter of security. Bodyguards within the crowd facing outward from the booth, looking for trouble before it gets to the row of booths and Peter Yip. Max receives the glance from Vincent. He's gestured down the middle of the dance floor towards the rear. They work their way through the massive bodies. Meanwhile, Vincent casually smiles at a girl and takes an oblique path, sliding along a convex sidewall. Vincent's path brings Vincent up behind bodyguard number one, who looks to the right just as bodyguard number one gets pounded in the kidney. Ow. His head is twisted around and torn back, dropping him to the floor amid the bodies and noise. Vincent's focus is already on bodyguard number two as he kicks down with ferocious force, slamming bodyguard one into unconsciousness. Bodyguard two intuits, turns. Vincent's foot slams his knee sideways, breaking it. Vincent's palm bounces the man's forehead back. His fist slams into his exposed neck that fast. Max, buffeted by dancers, saw backs away as bodyguard number three saw the assault on number two. He grabs for Vincent, who breaks the grab, pulls bodyguard's head, bodyguard head, ah, bodyguard number three's head and neck down towards him, slams his knee into the ribcage twice, breaking things, spins the man backwards, rips his head sideways and back a centimeter from breaking, and holds it there with his left arm. Vincent's right hand is filled with the H and K as he moves towards Peter Yip. Pedrosa just then sees Pedrosa POV Peter Yip glimpsed in the booth from Pedrosa's angle. There's Yip. Get him out of here. And Fed number one moves with Fed number two along the wall on the opposite side towards Yip while Petrosa crosses the floor, sees the disturbance, and over his right shoulder, right there is... Vincent! <laughs> it's like Ace Attorney. Mad Dog Killer, Vincent. Middle of the dance floor, there he is. 
feds and HRT with assault weapons push through the dancers. FBI, freeze, Vincent. Don't move. Freeze, hands in the air. Max hears they spotted Vincent. Then he realizes the three, four weapons of cops fighting through crowds are all aimed at him. People who aren't falling away from him are confused. Max is the loneliest man in the room. Don't shoot, I'm not Vincent. But Korean hip hop thunders. Korean music videos are crazy visuals. Rapper next to Yip thinks he's getting busted, wants to get out, while bodyguards four and five are either are at either end of Yip's booth, struggling to see where from where the threat is coming. Korean gangsters behind the booth put hands on I know <laughs> Korean gang, uh, sorry Korean gangsters behind the booth put hands on weapons. They see Fed number one and number two slide from behind the patrons, closing in to get Yip to safety. Yeah. Freeze! Hands in the air! On your knees! Now! Now! Korean gangster number one gets pushed sideways by Fed number one, who's trying to reach Yip, sees the weapon in Fed, hand, Fed number one's hand. So he pulls his nine millimeter, which Fed number two shoves sideways, but the gun fires, hitting an incoming Pedrosa in the upper thigh, slamming him face first to the floor. And with the first gunshot, all hell breaks loose. Max drops to the floor. Rounds are fired at him by Yip's bodyguard number five. A dancer is hit. Paco gives a look to Rubio, who's moved within, who's moved to within 30 feet of Max. He nods, yes, take out Vincent. But the real Vincent, advancing to the Yip booth, sees the red line through the smoke and the jewel of a laser point dance around Max's ear. Sees the source. Vincent's H and K over a nearly dead bodyguard number three swings left and punches three rounds into Rubio. Max sees Vincent saved his life as Vincent spots Paco 10 feet away. Your he got the joke. <laughs> he drops to the floor for cover to disappear while Max is on the floor and destroyed furniture, overturned tables, panicked patrons, and Fanning, low, pushing through the chaos, gets a glimpse of Max. Fanning shoves sideways to reach him, imbued with his mission for some inexplicable reason. At Booth, Peter Yip is protected from his com- by his confused scrum of Korean <laughs> gangsters and bodyguards. Funny. Girls dove under tables. The rapper and one bodyguard struggles through the crowd that traps them to get out while Vincent, the only calm in the storm, has dumped bodyguard number three and is moving in on the cluster of protection at Peter Yip's booth. When? From the left side of bodyguard number one, breathing in rafts and risen from the dead, has grabs for the gun in Vincent's right hand as Fanning gets to Max. I'm Max. I'm a goddamn cab driver. I know. I know. Fanning grabs him, keeps him low, pushes his head down. I'm Detective Fanning, LAPD. I'm getting you out of here. And they slide back behind the off back ah back behind ah and they slide behind the back of the opposite banquette, seeking cover and break towards a rear exit. While heavy Korean gangster also slams Vincent gun hand with a short baton. Vincent's disarmed. Two men are on him. A knife in Vincent's left hand sinks into bodyguard number one's leg, dropping him. Korean gangster swings the baton for Vincent's head. Vincent steps inside, traps the man's arm, takes the baton releases his torqued body and backhands it across the gangster's neck. Vincent slams a forehand across his ribs. As the Korean gangster concussed, falls backwards, forcing Vincent to the floor, bodyguard number four, coming up the middle from Yip's booth where attention focuses right now on the real threat, Vincent fires a three-shot burst from an SMG, which is a submachine gun in case anybody was caring. Um, And Vincent, retrieving his H&K, rolls concussed Korean gangster off of him, and Vincent places four shots into bodyguard number four. Vincent's assault will be in a straight line. Now he rolls onto one knee, fires two more, dropping African-American bodyguard number five, who had two handguns blazing and rising. Vincent's almost at Yip's booth. Korean gangster is blown back. Another tries to help 300-pound Yip escape over the back. He's hit. Peter Yip falls back into the banquette, his eyes wider because Vincent is coming. Vincent reloads. As his thumb hits the slide release and it jacks forward, he's already fired around into Yip. And Yip's eyes, at the fierce fate of death approaching, are filled in with his last are filled in his last moments with Vincent, who fires four rounds. One to the head, that fast. The wall of frosted glass with a plane of water running down it behind dead Peter Yip is untouched. Serene. Wounded Pedrosa. Feds are shouting. HRT are searching. Bodyguards are surrendering. Korean gangsters scream at each other. Inane Korean infomercials, videos, while interior backstairs, Max and Fanning race past karaoke and music recording rooms and escape down the backstairs. Fanning pushes Max ahead, covers their rear. Max and Fanning from the bottom of the stairs. Oh man, am I happy to see you. I don't believe it. Yeah, I know. Relax. Breathe. You're okay. Other patrons have collapsed on the stairs and huddle on the landing. Max and Fanning slide by and step over them to get to the the exit door to the back alley. 
I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Fanning guides Max forward. Emotions flood out of Max. Ten hours of traumatic stress. His nightmare is over. He's home free. Tears stream down his face. Exterior side street behind club wide on Fanning and Max emerge. Boom, boom, boom. Fanning is dead before he hits the ground. <laughs> nice death. Max is horrified. Vincent grabs Max, propelling him forward. Get in. <laughs> He throws Max behind the wheel, gets in the back. Drive. Max, numb, hits the gas, peels out, his door left open, hands barely on the wheel, driving in motor skills impaired, scraping off the sides of adjacent cars. Dead Detective Fanning, now inert, is left behind. Cut to exterior aerial shot, Los Angeles cityscape, night, straight down from above. Acid mint street light and pools on Olympic Boulevard. The yellow cab is the only vehicle heading east. Everything else streams west. Emergency vehicles, flashers, interior, Max's cab, Max in shock. Back in purgatory, eternally in his cab's front seat. As the lone yellow cab drives east, a single on Vincent. What a clusterfuck. Only thing didn't show up was the Polish Calvary. <laughs> Max's life, controlled by Vincent, is a nightmare, perpetual and eternal. You don't want to talk? Tell me to fuck off. Fuck well. Vincent's attention is out the window at the streams of emergency vehicles, at the earpiece filled with LAPD and news helicopters. Exterior street frontal of the anonymous yellow cab heads east. All other traffic races to the debacle left behind. Blood, bloody fluid, and death get to you. Try deep breathing. Remember, we'll all die anyway. You had to kill Fanning? Who's Fanning? Interior cab. That cop! Why'd you have to do that? You couldn't wound him? The guy had a family, maybe parents. Kids who gotta grow up without a dad. He was a good guy and he believed me. I should have saved him because he believed you? No, not just that. Yeah, that. Yeah, so what's wrong with that? It's what I do for a living. Some living. Head downtown. What's downtown? How are you at math? I was hired for five hits. I did four. One more. There you go. Why don't you kill me and find another cab? Because you're good. We're in this together. You know, fates intertwined, cosmic coincidence, all that crap. Oh, you're full of shit. I'm full of shit. You're a monument of it. You even bullshitted yourself. All I am is talking about the garbage. Bad guys killing bad guys. Because that's what you said. And you believe me? What did they do? How do I know? But they all got that witness for the prosecution look to me. It's probably some major federal indictment against somebody who majorly does not want to get indicted. I don't know. That's the reason? That's the why. There is no reason, no good reason, no bad reason, to live or to die. Then what are you? Indifferent. Vincent hesitates, then back out the window. Get with it, get over it. Millions of galaxies of hundreds of millions of stars and a speck on one in a blink. That's us, lost in space. The universe don't care. The cop, you got me? Who notices? What's with you? As in? Man, if someone had a gun to your head and said, you gotta tell me what's going on with that person across the street, there, what they think, who they are, how they feel, or I will kill you, they'd have to kill you, wouldn't they? Because you don't have a clue about anyone. I don't, I don't think you, you have a clue, period. Did anyone do for you in your life ever? When you draw breath in the morning, open your eyes in the AM, you anticipate anything, want anything, expect anything? I, I don't think so. 
because you are low, my brother, way low. And some standard parts that are supposed to be there with you aren't. So what happened to you, man? What happened to you? All the Gabby's in LA, I get Max. Sigmund Freud meets Dr. Ruth. Answer the question. Look in the mirror. With your paper towels, a bottle of 409, a limo company someday. How much you got saved? None of your business. Your business plan someday. Someday my dream will come. And why not you wake up and discover it all flipped on you. Suddenly you're old and it didn't happen and it never will because you were never going to do it anyway. The dream on the horizon became yesterday and got lost. Then you'll have bullshit in yourself. It could never have been anyway. And you'll recede into memory and zone out in a bark lounger with daytime TV on for the rest of your life. Don't talk to me about killing. You're doing yourself. In this yellow-orange prison, bit by bit, every day. Extremely close, Max is soaking up every word. All it ever took was a down payment on a Lincoln Town car. What the hell are you still doing in a cab? The needle on the speedometer is creeping past 40. Because I never straightened up and looked at it, you know? Slow down. Myself? I should have. My brother's dead. Tried to gamble my, my way out from under. Another born to lose deal. And then it's got to be perfect to go, you know? Risk all torque down. Needle pushing 60. I mean, do you know what? It doesn't matter. Oh, what's it matter anyway? Because we are insignificant out here in this big ass nowhere. Twilight zone shit, says the badass sociopath in my back seat. So that's one thing I got to thank you for, bro. Until now, I never saw it that way. <clears throat> the cab goes blasting through an intersection on a red light. A Los Angeles Times delivery truck slams on its brakes as Max swerves, barely avoiding a collision. That was a red light. Max glances in the rear view. Not until now. So, what's it all matter? <laughs> Don't. Fuck it. Fix it. Nothing to lose, right? Vincent's H&K aimed at Max's head. Max almost laughs. Slow the hell down. Why? What are you gonna do? Pull the trigger? Kill us? Go ahead, man. Shoot my ass. Slow down. Vincent. Their eyes meet in the rearview mirror. Vincent is arrested by a look in Max he has not seen before. It's the even, confrontational man of a look of a man with nothing to lose. Go fuck yourself. Max slams on the brakes and cranks the steering wheel hard to the right. Exterior street, right wheel, hits a low divider, rear end comes up stuck. Rear end comes, rear end comes unstuck, rotating over the front end and flipping the cab into a violent roll onto its roof, spinning down the street, smashing off other cars, pieces falling off, spewing glass. And then settling upside down, revolving slowly to a creaking stop, antifreeze spilling onto the pavement. And then everything goes silent, motionless, still. Interior, cab, wreckage, steam from the ruptured radiator, crumpled metal, missing hood, disintegrated windshield, shattered glass. Max is trapped upside down in his seatbelt, his roof half caved in, one side of his face streaked with blood. Alive, but dazed. Movement in the back, a sharp intake of breath, then a voice. Well, that was brilliant. Was your seatbelt fastened, honey? And a bloody hand shoots from the darkness behind him, plunging an aluminum section that used to hold the, pa the perspex screen in place. Max jerks his head aside, and the aluminum rail misses him by inches, ramming solidly into the headrest instead. Max releases his seatbelt, dropping and hitting the ceiling of the cab. Vincent, sardined in the reduced space of the back, lunges forward. Max wildly fights to keep the knife at bay and crawl out of his window. We hear a police siren. Vincent, eyes glittering, kicks out the window on the other side. Max, crawling away on the pavement, keeping low, the taxi between them looks back. 
Max's POV. Vincent in a glimpse, running off into the night. Vincent's hand pulls out the 45 para ordnance back up from his waistband. Vincent's shoes crunch on broken glass. He vanishes into the darkness as the siren grows near. Max pushes painfully to his feet, looks around. A surreal moment. Max standing by his overturned cab, the empty city all around him, breathing the cool night air, alive. It strikes him in that moment. He survived the night. The blood pumping through his veins is a fact. It stuns him, overwhelms him. How good is life? The black LA, the LAPD black and white screeches to a stop. A sergeant gets out. Uh, one two eight seven five requesting an RA unit at Grand and Ninth with a TC for injuries. Sergeant looking at the truly wrecked cab. You all right? What happened? And the mundane beauty of the question makes Max look at him like he's crazy, and there are tears streaming down his face. The sergeant approaches Max, gentle but firm. You've been in an accident. An ambulance is on its way to help you. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Sit down on the curb, okay? Anyone else in there? Max shakes his head. The sergeant shines his flashlight on the passenger compartment concerned about Max. Don't worry about the cab. They'll get you a new one. You okay? I'm fine. Fine. Just dizzy and shit. You sit there and breathe deep, sir. You'll be okay. The sergeant, now at the rear of the cab, makes sure to make sure there's no gasoline spill, suddenly freezes, his flashlight beam finding the trunk lid, lid ajar from the crash, and inside is the corpse of Ramon Gallardo in a sprawled heap. Put your hands where I can see him. Get on your knees. Slowly. Huh? Sergeant's gun is out on Max. Max does as he's told, getting to his knees on the pavement. Curious, the whole thing strikes Max as insane, absurd. Exterior street Max. Sure. Arrest me. Take me in. Police station. L.A. County's good. And he's on his knees, hands on his head. Sergeant coming up behind him, covering him. Per procedure, the sergeant holsters his weapon, draws his cuffs, and grabs Max's right wrist, cuffing it. Max, slow-mo. One arm is brought down behind his back. Max's POV pushed slowly into debris from the wreckage. Granules of shattered safety glass. Max's onboard computer that Vincent used upside down and on and tighter on Max, slow-mo, as he sees the display from Vincent's flash drive of the last two targets. Max's face, Max's, Max falls forward and flattens his face on the pavement to see. Max's POV pushing in, the split image. On the left is Peter Yip. On the right is Annie Farrell, assistant U.S. attorney. Max, slow-mo. Breath goes out of him. Target number five is Annie. As the sergeant is struggling for Max's left hand, now Max lunges for under shattered glass, the visible grip of Vincent's 45 H and K. Max pulls the sergeant off balance, whips the H and K around while still on his back, jamming the gun to the sergeant's head. Sergeant's hand reaches for his holstered Beretta. Get your hand off your gun. Max jams the gun tighter to the sergeant's head. He's not certain where to point it. Look. Someone's going to get killed if I don't... It's... Put your gun down. No. I gotta go, see? You don't... Put the gun down. Hey, hey. When did this become a negotiation? Max grabs the gun out of the sergeant's holster and tosses it under the car. He takes his second set of cuffs. Cuff yourself to the goddamn door. The sergeant cuffs his arm through the window frame of the open squad car door. Max tosses the key. Trapped. You are in a world of shit. Good. Do us a favor. Call the police. I'm going to six and big. I, I got a... I've got no time to explain. And the last the sergeant sees of him, Max is vanishing up the street into the darkness. Exterior street, Max. Running. Stripped of everything now, operating purely on instinct. Vincent's gun in his right hand, handcuffed dangling from his left wrist, running. The city silent around him, the only sound is his feet hitting the pavement, running. Two cop cars rocketing through an intersection a block or so behind, sirens wailing. Max veers for cover, not breaking stride, pressing on. More distant sirens. Now, police units responding, Max racing up the middle of the street. Seeing a late night partier come out of the standard with a cell phone. Oh, the standard. Max grabs the phone right out of his hand as he sails past him. The party are spinning around to chase after him. Hey, jerk! Hey, fuck off! <laughs> the man does. Max keeps running, dialing, fumbling Annie's business card from his pocket, getting the numbers wrong, trying again, and he finally stops, gasping for breath, punching in on the final numbers. A lousy signal. 
Camera circles around Max to reveal exterior parking structure. Max runs up the stairs of the parking structure to get a better signal. He and we see Max's POV federal building across the freeway. Dark offices. Only a few have lights on, except... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Three floors that are completely lit. 14th through 16th. Come on. Go through. Go through. Through intermittent cell phone static, we hear ringing on the other end. Interior federal building lobby Vincent Knight uses a card similar to the one we saw in the front to gain access to the elevator lobby without setting off the alarms. But this card is connected to a wristband with other key cards and the identification card of a heavyset black woman. We don't understand, wider, beyond Vincent, the lobby's vacancy is sinister. Interior elevator night. Vincent rides up watching the numbers climb. Exterior parking structure night. Max waves. Heart pounding, phone ringing, eye scanning the windows. We see a figure on the uppermost well-lit floor, 16 through the south windows, cross an office to grab the phone. Annie, intercut with interior U.S. Attorney's Office, Annie Knight, lays down some files and grabs up the phone, bleary from exhaustion. She wasn't kidding about pulling an all-nighter. Annie Farrow. Annie? It's Max. Max. Max, the cab driver. Max? Kind of strange time to be calling. Listen, listen, okay? There's a man. His name's Vincent. He's coming to kill you. He's what? Where are you? Kill you! He's coming to kill you! Is this a joke? Because it's not, it is not funny. A guy, Felix, hired him. Or people Felix works for. He's already killed witnesses. Now he's coming after you. He was scoping out your building when I dropped you off. I don't know what happened, but he got into my cab. Interior, elevator lobby, elevator door, slide open. Vincent emerges onto the floor using a master key card to enter the office. Interior office, Annie tries to decipher what Max is saying through the cell phone dropouts. Did you say Felix, as in Reyes Torreina? How do you know about my case? I don't understand. It doesn't matter. Get out of the goddamn building. Interior hallway night, but it's too late. Vincent's at a wooden door in the wooden glass office interior with an assistant U.S. attorney Annie Farrell sign. He kicks in the door at the lock. It slams open. He's through. H and K up. Reverse. Nothing. Empty. No one's home. It's not the same office. Vincent steps in. Interior 16th floor office. Annie finally grasps what Max is telling her. Okay, okay, Max. I believe you. I'll get out of the building. No, no, wait. Exterior parking structure, Max. Sees across the freeway. Vincent looking through Annie's office. It's on the 14th floor. Low angle past Max. Camera tilts up to reveal Annie two floors above. She's frozen at a table in the law library on the south wall, phone to her ear. Interior 14th floor, Annie's office. Vincent sees purse, takeout, coffee cups. Vincent knows she's still here. And the angle becomes over Vincent out the window to the parking structure below and to the speck on the roof. Max watching him. Exterior parking structure, Max. He's two floors below you. In my office. If I'm supposed to be reading the script, bro, sorry. Right. In Where my are, office. Where are you? What floor? 16, law library and files. He doesn't know you're up there. Stay right where you are. Call 911. Max, are you sure? Call the goddamn police. Don't move from that spot. Interior, 14th floor night. Vincent pauses from examining offices with half glass interior walls. His eyes go to a desk phone. Three banks of extensions, all dark. Only one of the extension buttons is glowing. Then it goes out. Then it lights up again. Glowing light. It's Annie calling 911. Next to it is typed the extensions location. File section, 16th floor. Vincent looks up. He knows where she is. Camera tilts up of his tilts up of his look. Exterior parking structure. Max sees. Realizes Vincent knows where she is. Hang up. Hang up, Annie. Get out. He knows where you are. Interior 16th floor file section. Annie lost in cell phone intermittent cutout. Hello, Max. What did you say? No use. He's gone. She punches a clear line, dials 911. Oh, sorry. Was there, did we miss a line? 
Oh, sorry. Okay. Exterior parking. I saw the omit and thought it was one. Exterior parking structure. Max frantically hits redial. Nothing. No signal. Shrill, fast, busy tone. No cell service. Shit. Pure desperation. He glances over the abutment to the grass slope below. No time to think. He acts. Fuck it. He jumps, clumsily falling, rolling, falling down the slope with Max. Desperately, desperate, not graceful, pushing to his feet, ankle wrenched, racing slash hobbling, grass stained hoodie across interior 14th floor, long lens on Max, crossing the bridge of, over the Harbor Freeway to the office building. Interior 16th floor file section night with Annie's with Annie as Annie listens to the 911 recording. Your call will be answered in the order received if this is not an emergency. Exterior federal building lobby gas co west west overview. Max enters. The sidewalk is elevated above the lobby. Through the brightly lit glass walks Mac walks. Max sees the lobby is strangely vacant. No security guards. Then he sees a long smear of blood across the white stone. Exterior 16th floor file section. Annie finally hears a faint cl- finally hears a click on the line as 911, how can I help you? There's a man in the building. He's trying to kill me. I'm Interior utility room 16th floor fire axe whack. Vincent swings it again, instantly severing the 16th floor's power and telephone trunk line. Sparks emit from the bundled cables in the thick conduit. He tosses the axe, exits into the hallway, jabs the elevator button. Exterior, federal building, lobby, east view. Max appears and sees dead night watchwoman squeezed behind the security desk. Interior, file section, night, as Annie finds herself talking to a deadline. Hello? Meanwhile, exterior, building, lobby, night. Max hurls a steel trash can at the glass wall with all his might. It just bounces off. Max pauses, stymied. He raises Vincent's H&K clumsily in one hand, braces himself, squeezes the trigger. Nothing. Is there a safety on this thing? He finds it. He tries again, fires two shots into the glass door. The gun almost kicks out of his hand, but the door disintegrates. He walks through. Interior 16th floor, file section, night, Annie frozen with indecision. What to do? Stay or go? In keeping with the building's design, a wall of glass separates this area from the buildings from the corridor beyond, which is separated by glass from other offices and the lobby. Normally, you'd be able to see people working, walking down the hallway. Right now, the corridor is dark. Terrifying. She forces herself to move to cross the office. Run now for the door to the internal corridor. But she only gets about 10 feet before she's stopped by a door opening, a soft footstep. Somebody's there. Somebody's stealthy. She backs up against the floor to ceiling windows, frozen, heart pounding, listening against the city at night out the windows. She backs up further towards the window, back into interior file section where she backs past file cabinets. Not deep enough. Nowhere to hide. So she backs along the glass. Nothing now but the city glow spilling faintly through the windows. Low shelves of legal books, tables offering no cover, while a shadow tracks across the city laid out to the south. The 110 and 10 like arteries carrying white and red cells, headlights, and taillights. Annie crouches under a table and crawls backwards. She can't hear a thing. Her heart pounds. The silence makes her want to scream. A POV of empty, scary office. Over the table, background, is the glass wall running the length of the office area. The corridor beyond, empty. A shadow? Did she see a shadow past the murky darkness out there? A soft sound. Feet on carpet. Did she hear it? Is she imagining it? The breath catches in her throat, eyes wide. The shadow in the bullpen by a corridor, it lurks silently, waiting. It's Vincent. Frontal Vincent, then he moves, softly, quietly, tied on Annie, under the table, by the windows, a huddled form against the city lights and helicopters, waiting, not breathing. Still as a statue, then the urge is too strong. She's got to get out, get out now. Annie's on her hands and knees, trying to crawl away soundlessly, not realizing that walking upon her soundlessly from the back is Vincent. She doesn't know. He's a shadow in the dimness. Annie senses, stops, turns, and sees the shape. 20 feet away of Vincent, the paraordinance 45 coming up. The 45 cow barrel like a tunnel into nothingness. Vincent's eyes are cold and indifferent. Vincent's finger squeezing off the slack on the trigger. Vincent's eyes, sense, stops, turns. A silhouette in a doorway, aiming a gun. He's backlit by a red emergency light on a rear wall. For a moment, Vincent can't bring himself to believe it. Max? Let her go. Vincent smiles. It's harsh, almost canine. What are you going to do? Shoot? Blam! A muzzle flash. Vincent got kicked in the head. He goes sprawling. Max rushes up to Annie, grabs her arm, jerks her away. Max? He pulls her to her feet, both of them backing away, running for the door. A groan. 
Knox pulls her harder. Vincent rises, gets behind cover, sitting up, eyes glittering, hand clasped to the side of his head, blood coursing through his fingers. Jesus, Max, you shot my ear off. <laughs> well, his name is Vincent. I'm sorry, that's a terrible joke. He pulls his hand away, sitting on the floor, staring at the sheet of blood on his palm. He looks at the fleeing Max. Okay, Max. Interior glass corridors. Vin Max has the H&K aimed, backing for the rear lobby, for the elevator lobby. Vincent appears around a corner, clearing space. Fast. His pair of ordnance up. Max and Annie running now. Vincent sees vague shapes. Boom, 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 boom. The pun gunshots punch through the glass, inches from Max and Annie, collapsing walls, revealing Vincent against the L.A. scape. Blossoms of white flame. Boom, boom. Interior elevator lobby, and a moment later, the glass wall explodes into the corridor by a chair, crashing through it, followed by Vincent into the elevator lobby while interior elevator Max hits the ground floor button and close. The door is taking a million years to do just that. As they're sliding shut, he sees Vincent across the lobby, raising the gun. Max throws himself on Annie, both to the floor. Bullets punch through the paper-thin sheet metal doors. But the elevator's moving now. Interior 16th floor hallway, leaving Vincent behind. He darts for the stairs. Interior elevator. Max and Annie on the floor, breathing hard, staring at each other in wordless shock. They reach the ground floor. Interior building lobby. And Max drags her forward, the two of them racing across for the exit. Seen wide and high in a rear shot, Gasco lobby running to southeast. Interior building stairwell. Vincent careens down the steps, and the entire side of his head bloody, his ear mostly gone. He slams through a door into interior lobby where he finds the elevator standing empty. He hears a door alarm, turns, runs across the lobby. Interior lower lobby, Vincent enters and runs, races across the frozen escalator to camera. Interior MTA rear shot. Max and Annie enter and run through the interior hall or down the lower staircase. Interior exterior MTA. Low wide angle, Vincent entering from, from the street diagonally down to cam. The office building is behind him. Interior boarding platforms, green line. Max and Annie race towards the boarding area. Hardly anyone in sight except for an old white homeless guy with a TV set and a shopping cart powered by a car battery. Call the police! He stares at them like they're nuts. They run towards the empty platform. No train. Neon lit, strange art like dead people floating in a pool hangs from the ceiling. Max and Annie run, turning this way and that, trying to decide what to do. Over Annie and Max, same. They run down another staircase where we see the blue line platforms running at 90 degrees. No train there either. They run, they race down trying to get away <clears throat> because exterior top of stairs to green line platform, rear shot, Vincent runs into frame, sees Max and Annie 50 to 70 yards away, racing down the stairs to the blue line. A difficult shot. Vincent aims, elevates the front sight. Boom, boom, boom. He fires three shots. Interior blue line platform, Max and Annie cut by 45 caliber bullets, chewing craters in the ceramic tiles inches from them. Interior blue line, Max and Annie here now, a train pulling in. But it's upstairs on the green line. They run down the platform to the stairs back up. Interior green line platform, Vincent running, sees the train approaching on the opposite platform. He looks down to the stairs as to the blue line. A train pulls in there too. Decision time. Interior green line, the fourth subway car, Max and Annie are discovered crawling into the car. They collapse, low on the floor, waiting for the doors to close, the train to pull out, hoping Vincent hasn't followed. Vincent has to decide, has to second guess Max, a beat. The train sits there for seconds, it seems like hours, like fucking forever. Vincent riveted to the spot. Max and Annie praying Vincent doesn't appear. The door starts to close, the doors start to close, sliding irrevocably shut. Vincent, then he knows. With no hesitation, he leaps off the platform onto the rails as the train starts to pull out. Interior fourth subway car, Max and Annie are at the sliding, are at the sliding, which joins the fourth car to the third car. The train's picking up speed. Where's Vincent? As a precaution, they start for the third car. Exterior MTA helicopter from above. We're out of the subway on the surface. Interior third car, Max and Annie low down the aisle of the third car, rising for the door. As Max turns and looks, Vincent standing in the fourth car, staring at him. Interior second car, Max and Annie race in as rounds punch through glass into the second car. Rounds slam through metal and glass. Interior fourth car, Vincent Knight. Vincent is coming. Various angles and the sequence builds. Vincent working towards the front, Max and Annie desperately looking for cover. City racing by, train racing by city. A few ragged passengers trying to huddle out of harm's way with nowhere to go. As the train huddles and shrieks around the track junctures, the first car, 
Max and Annie rush in, slide the door shut. This is as far as they can go. They drop into a crouch at the door, breathing hard, terrified. Max with his back against the wall, arms stiffly keeping the door handle wedged tight, his head just below the door's window. A harsh, ragged whisper. Where's the next station? A frozen moment, eyes locked, knowing they're probably going to die together, even though they hardly know each other. The train goes black, lights dying as they shriek over another juncture, then the lights return, stuttering. Max rises slightly up, peers over the lip of the window. Here comes fucking Vincent down the aisle of the second car. He sees Max. He shouts, barely audible from here. You can't win, Max. I do this for a living. And he keeps coming, 45 at his side, a sheet of blood down his face from the missing part of his ear. The visage of Vincent, the 45 in his hand, scares the shit out of early morning passengers. And Max clutches the H&K, takes a deep, shaky breath, his eyes on Annie's, not even sure in that moment what he's going to do, probably die. And then he lunges up, Vincent not 10 feet away, and the train goes dark. A blizzard of muzzle, muzzle flashes, both men firing through the windows at each other, glass shattering between the cars and getting sucked away by the wind. Max screaming, face lit only by the gunfire, clumsy in how he holds Vincent's H&K, firing one-handed, not aiming, not looking where he's shooting. This is a waste of bullets, bugs me. Vincent's para ordinance booming out massive eruptions of flame. And then abrupt silence as the lights return, Max looking down, his expression nearly childlike with terror. He stares at the H and K in his shaking hand, sees the slide is locked back, guns empty. He rises up. His look says, go ahead, kill me, through the shattered window. Vincent's standing in the other car, right where we left him, watching Max. Little smile on his face. Interior, Vincent's car, night. Vincent ejects the empty magazine. Before it even hits the floor or at his feet, Vincent's hand loading a full mag. The weapon pointed at Max like it was when he reloaded and shot Peter Yip the first time. Odd, though. His fingers aren't working that well. His brilliant sleight of hand seems gone. He fumbles the reload, in fact. The magazine of stacked 45s drops, landing at his feet among the expended casings. A few fresh droplets of blood patters quietly. Vincent considers picking up the mag, but it suddenly seems like way too much trouble. He blinks at the 45 in his hand as if confused, and then turns and starts unsteadily back towards the back of the car. The 45 slips from his fingers, clattering to the floor. Max watches Vincent walking away. Vincent only makes it halfway. He has to sit down. He grabs an aluminum pole, easing himself onto the seat, trying to catch his breath. Max slides the door open, steps across the bridge between the cars, slides the second door open, enters. Vincent turns his head slightly, watching Max draw cautiously nearer. Max stares down, sees the blood spreading across the floor beneath Vincent, turning into quite a pool. Vincent tries to speak, can't quite manage it. Max sits across from him. Annie appears in the background watching them. Vincent and Max sit there, riding the train, softly. We're almost at the next station. Vincent smiles faintly. He leans his head towards Max as if conferring a secret, in a halting whisper. Guy gets on a subway, dies, thinking nobody will notice. Max look in, looks into Vincent's eyes. It means, I'm that guy, and will anyone notice me when I'm gone? Vincent leans back, gazing straight ahead now, rocking gently with the motion of the train. And with much effort and to Max's amazement, he, he emits a soft, rasping wheeze, but it's a faint laugh all the same. Max has no idea what's so funny to a dying man. Vincent looks. Max follows his gaze. There, right across the car, <laughs> among all the advertisements near the ceiling, is an ad. The whitest sand and bluest sea you can imagine. A dream place. Limitless horizon. Interior, Vincent's car. Max, Don. Vincent's no longer laughing. In fact, Vincent's no longer doing anything. Ever. Annie comes to Max and sits. She shivers. Max takes off his zippered, hooded sweatshirt and puts it around her. It's a small gesture, but it's a protective and confident act. She takes his hand. Dawn lightens the sky ahead. They ride the train together, side by side, neither saying a word, for now. The train pulls into a station, wide angle of subway car, and Max pulls Annie to her feet. The door is open. They silently get off. The first sideways streams of yellow light shaft into the station. The doors close again. The train pulls out. We hold on Vincent for a while, riding the train by himself into the dawn, his head back as if sleeping, alone in the car as the sun rises. Another dead guy on the subway, riding into a new day. And Max, in his polo shirt and dirty pants, and arm around Annie, wearing his stained sweatshirt, rises to us above the uh, rises to us up the escalator. Freeways, arteries of traffic behind them fade out. <laughs> Thank you. Good job, Thank you. everybody. That's so weird, though. How did that? Like when the people board the train in the morning, aren't they just going to notice this dead guy sprawled out to hell? 
It's depends so if weird. they notice. Depends if they notice the blood or not. This actually has happened in major cities before. There was a dead guy riding a tour bus for like five hours. He was on the upper deck, and that was in New York. Um, there have been dead bodies on mass transit before. Oh my in god! LA. But I've ridden like transit like in Utah and at six a.m. and the things are packed. So, away. so they literally what? nobody sits and be like, "What the hell is this?" Mark, what'd you say? I said it wouldn't be the weirdest thing you see on the New York subway. <laughs> wouldn't be the weirdest thing you see in LA either. Uh, this yeah, guy, because he's in LA, is just weird. This guy, because he's bloody, they might notice. But if someone just died, like, and they look like they're sleeping right there. Yeah, like, like I said, if they, if they know, it depends if they notice the blood pooling under him. If they don't, you'd be surprised. You have enough and people getting out of Koreatown and dumping bags of stuff on the ground. They're not going to notice till they get home. And the guns, what ha do they just, t do they just leave the guns there? Like, oh, the, uh, guns, they, they oh, might the, the guns are on the floor. Look at these pretty guns. They might notice the shell casings. It depends. Um, then again, between the bangers and the tourists, you never know who's going to pick what up off a floor. All right. Can you can pawn that stuff for the gold, right? Um, Heckler and Koch isn't gold. You would pawn the gun, assuming you could find somebody who would uh, scorch the serial number. Well, before oh, we keep talking, because, like, yeah, sorry, sorry. Sorry. I, I know some have to go early tonight, so we'll go around and say who you guys are, what you're doing, and then we can talk about more. Before you guys go, if you can tell me just what you guys thought about it. Um, but, all right, Vicky Dykes. Hi, I'm Vicky Dykes. Um, I'm from central Alberta, a little town called Penhold. I'm an actress, and... Uh, I've got a few projects on the go. Um, um, most of them are kind of like back burner, but uh, uh, I've got a lot going on in my world right now. So it's exciting and uh, you just never know what's going to happen next. It's awesome that there's a lot of exciting things going on. Yeah, can't wait to hear about them. And Morgan Toll. Hi, I'm Morgan. Um, I am a Los Angeles-based um, actor, SAG-AFTRA. Um, I'm also a talent coordinator for a company called Streamily. Um, if you haven't heard of it, definitely check it out. It's super cool. Um, we do live Q&As and autograph signings for celebrities. Um, uh, yeah, that's me. Sweet. Oh, Instagram uh, at Morgan Elizabeth Toll. All right. And Vicki, I think we missed where they can find you this time. Uh, I know you're muted. Yo, I should have this memorized. I do. Um, yoga. Yes. You can yoga grandma me. seven. Yoga grandma seven. Or is that it? Oh, sorry. I, I, I was just going to say you can find me on Facebook uh, under the name Vicki Dykes. And I'm also on Instagram. I'm Yoga Grandma Seven. All right. And Petra Stedman. Hello. Petra Stedman, uh, actress, writer, working in, uh, we'll go with the States. I'm close to Morgan, though, so we'll say hi. Um, yeah, just you can find me on Instagram. I just got an Instagram, still nothing on it. Petropedia42, or uh, come, I don't know, hunt me down on Twitter. I'm usually far more active on there. <laughs> sweet, sweet. Thank you. And Heather Lee Cameron. Hi, I'm Heather Lee Cameron. I'm an actor. I'm a writer. And I'm a family history research student. And I also produce my own videos on YouTube. Got a lot of them. I've got over 5,000. Wow. wow. Yeah. I, all my links can be, my work can be found on Heather Lee Freelancer on Facebook or on my YouTube channel, The Storm and Latter-day Saint. And that has all my links, although my Instagram and my Twitter also provides a link to my link tree. And I posted links to some of my productions, including the, the uh, mini series where I have a scene that's available on Amazon Prime called Angel Dust. I play a, a girl named Kim that was released last month. And I've also got other projects. Those links are available on my link tree. And I've got res I've got a resume. I've got an actress access page. And, and I'm on the other pages as well. You can, if you have work for me, which I can do remotely. I'm already doing school remotely, so I can work remotely too. And I'm a dual citizen of Canada and the United States, so I can work through both countries legally. 
um, you can contact me at heather.lee.cameron at gmail.com. All right. And so Heather doesn't berate me. I'm Jacob Patrick, jacobpatrick.com. Oh, I do not berate you. I wish I knew your middle name. I know. So Encourage I me. Encourage me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, jacobpatrick.com. I like to screenwrite in my free time. And you can find me here at the Table Read Tuesdays every week. I uh, encourage him because he is a being of worth. We all are. Everyone we all watching. Are. Everyone. But here. you're the one that seems to need to be. Oh, and Mulder. The most. Let's focus on Mulder. Right there, one years old. <laughs> Wonder Mulder. Pup cameo! Yay! Mulder is Morgan's baby, and Mulder is the cutest freaking thing in the world. So adored. He's just Sorry, Morgan. He's well. cuter than he's just as cute as you. Maybe a little cuter, just because he's a baby. <laughs> what a good little kid just chilling um all right those who have to go i understand thank you so much for being here and doing oh, this uh i think i'm actually gonna stick for a little while so he, you're stuck with me for a couple of minutes hi you know what that's actually <laughs> nice because i like being stuck with you. all right what did you guys feedback and then i gotta skedaddle because i have to pack okay Anyways, so let's focus on feedback first before we get into the oh. awesome family life general stuff Anyway, the bullets. So you wouldn't you pawn like the bullets or the casings for gold? Isn't there gold in casings, as I was asking before? Um, not usually. There's a variety of other metals. Usually, like brass oh. is pretty common. You you don't pawn casings. Um, oh. typically, you, you'd pick them up to avoid uh them getting trapped or something. Um, okay. Like or forensics or something, but no, you, you might pawn yeah. the guns if they left the guns. Yeah, like the and guns are valuable them. because, yeah. you know, all sorts of stuff with crazy guns happen every day and pawn shops, I, I guess they would sell for a lot in a pawn shop. Yeah, definitely. So what'd you guys think of the story? Very interesting. I'm glad I got to bring out the crazy black wig again. Awesome. I and like I, this wig. I found it at, at about... At, in a clear out in a thrift store for Halloween. They were clearing out all their Halloween crap and I found it for like $3 and I'm like, oh, I can use this. Already got its money's worth. Well, good job. Mm -hmm. um, did you guys see what was coming with the story? Were you surprised by anything? Anything hard to follow? Uh, I mean, my, okay. So like my combination of my background in forensics and that whole suspension of disbelief thing, I think it's a very intriguing story. Um, but I'm sorry that I, I know movies got a movie. I said this earlier, but the, the minute the cab got smashed, he would have, he would have popped him, tossed his butt in the trunk and taken off and gotten a new ride. It's like, um, it's, it's way too high profile, way too conspicuous. He's going to be calling attention left and right. And it's, I get you pick a cab driver for the knowledge of the city and that makes sense, but burn the cab at the very least, like don't, don't keep riding around in that thing take the cab driver with you get another car and take off but it's like i i had oh just or drive it into it. a lake oh no, no i mean I, I don't mean burn the cab i mean like don't i mean i, I don't i don't mean like physically set the cab oh, on fire it's over I mean, it paint it in a different color with a spray oh no, no no they don't have time for that but it's like this this <laughs> takes place over like one night this is almost like i like encapsulated you know plots and stuff like that like you know run lola run is a great example of this but this almost feels like the end of a movie in, in, a, in a good way like you you would expect all this in like the last part of a, of a film or something like the last half of it but it's a very cool concept I just um no when I say burn the cab I mean like they would get a new like like ditch the car and go get a new one is what I mean by when I say burn it like um I like that they at least addressed what you're saying there there's like a moment that he hesitates and thinks about killing him and moving on for there or not but then decides his decision, bad or not, decides to move forward. They at least dressed it, addressed it rather than just oh, ignore it. Well, the best way to get rid of the cab instead of just parking it somewhere is to either torch it really quickly or just talk, or drive it into a lake. Like get rid of the emergency brake, push it, and then. Sweetie, LA, uh, I mean, unless they're dumping, yeah, really like unless they're dumping it in the reservoir or something, best option, leave it in a bad part of town and uh, take off. But yeah, like like I said, when I okay. yeah, they, they needed to walk away and get in a car. <laughs> that's all. If, if, keep the cab driver for his street smarts and his knowledge of the city, but 
don't stick around in a in a very noticeable um wrecked cab that people are going to start paying attention to so good thing petra is a good person because she'd be a dangerous bad person (laughs) (laughs) yeah she would especially with the knowledge of forensics and i had no idea about that fascinating uh what else about the script and story or like the one thing i surprised about i watched a couple of videos and like they said that again like i said this movie the script is still different than some of the stuff in the movie but the videos i saw said that the coyotes was happenstance like they were filming and then they were there and so then they filmed it and they included it but that's in this version of the script so that makes me like debate and wonder when that was added and when the script like was written and if like they just edited out the parts that still were in the script. But. Well, they might've tried to like, maybe have it as like a thing. Cause there are coyotes and this is something that's in New York as well, but like you have um, encroachment, like urban encroachment, that's really common. So you have a lot of, you know, animals and stuff like that. I did find it interesting that like, I, um, there's a lot of lore and stuff in the desert and everything. So seeing, having a coyote cross your path in certain, um, lores and, and mythologies is like a really bad omen so you don't if, if a coyote crosses your path you stop your journey <laughs> you go back the way you came and wait for another day so i'm like kind of I, I don't know if that was maybe metaphorical and that's why it was in the original script and then they just happened to be lucky and catch them or if they were going to use like um uh hollywood animals for that and maybe that's why it was left in but i don't know it's one of those one of the things to think about. Hmm. Did, you, did you guys have any favorite lines in the movie or uh, things other than forensics <laughs> that you didn't like? I thought the fast pacedness of the dialogue um, was really well. was written oh, yeah. really well. Um, I enjoy, that's my favorite thing about scripts is dialogue. Um, and when it flows super quickly, um, I really like that. Definitely. So I was surprised because I'm not usually an action movie person. Um, oh, yeah, I, right. Yes, you are. Yeah. You're a good villain in them. Well, she I means mean, watching, right? Or... The most action I'll watch is like X-Files. Uh, but So you're not going to watch this movie after reading I may. it? Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I enjoyed it. Um, I, I mean... I wouldn't say it's like super in depth movie, but I enjoyed the dialogue and the characters. Um, it was kind of a funny like back and forth thing going on that I liked. So yeah. And Tom Cruise's performance in it is pretty pretty good. Um, um, I do have a question though. Anybody who's more familiar with this, is this the one where? he dressed up as a UPS driver and like delivered packages for a while. No, no, I I know not in the movie. I'm saying like, is this the one that he used prep? Like for for his prep? There was some movie in, in like the two thousands and this, this is from 2000, right? 2004. Like Castaway or something. Well, no, no, he, no, no, not, not the premise. Like it as prep for like the whole blending in thing. He, some some role he went undercover as like a delivery driver like a pack like a package delivery guy and delivered packages and nobody knew that he was tom cruise it's a little bit like uh when um robin williams and dustin hoffman were testing out their their drag for tootsie and and mrs doubtfire and they like went places and like nobody recognized them i think that was kind of the purpose he's he's literally meant to be like kind of the gray man of like the almost like the cia or underworld or something it's very interesting I'm looking and I see something on it, but it doesn't say what movie. Oh, yeah, for Collateral. You're right. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember people talking about it, but I wasn't sure like what it was because I didn't I didn't see the movie. So cool, cool, cool. All right. Um, Warg is an LA native. Are you like catching like the little references to like Fig? It's like oh, Figueroa. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, oh, all it's the streets. Kind of funny when they talk about the freeways. Like that's like such a common thing that people in LA talk about is the freeway. <laughs> You're like, don't go. Th- I, I I love that. Like the first thing that pops into my head when Annie and him are having the discussions. Me, I'm like, oh god, please, no, 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 don't do that. It's gonna be a it's, it's gonna be a parking lot. Don't do that. And then all of a sudden he he comes in with this thing. I'm like, better as long as he hops off on side streets and then immediately at the end of it, if you get a friend, I'm like, oh, okay, he's he knows what he's doing. He knows he knows of which he speaks. It's nice. <laughs> 
So they the description. So the description of the travel in LA. You guys are both from LA. How is it? Was it realistic? Sounded um, like it. Yeah. The, the parts of the reference real stuff. Yeah. Hmm. I did find it funny. They they reference like not <laughs> like like spring like Spring Street, not that one. I'm like, so they aren't referencing the LA courthouse, or they are. <laughs> I think that this movie could have been made now since now we can just pull up GPS or Uber. Yeah. Yeah, is... And the fact that he didn't have his own cell phone, he had to grab someone else's. And at that time, like there was harsh, like not as good signal service or the battery dies or whatever, but yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's, it's those nice little touches, but it's also like it both dates it and kind of makes it little changes you could totally make it now because there, there's still issues with cell service in parts of in parts of the city so i could i could absolutely see this being made now but it's also like what would be the change it's like i don't know the dark version of stuber or something <laughs> all right um cool so. trying to think uh Let's what about now. you <laughs> mother puppy what about you if Petra we ever Heather? Made if we ever meet, I need a cuddle from that puppy. Oh, same. <laughs> if, with your permission, of course. Oh, you would Since love it. Since it is a service dog. He would love it. You guys, uh, Petra and Heather, might consider checking out the movie? Uh, oh, gosh. It's, on, it's on Netflix if I have downtime. I, I could throw it on in the next, like, two weeks. I don't have a lot of downtime between now and end of semester, so. Understandable. Like I'm planning, it. I'm ready, I'm writing and I'm doing what I think I can and I'm planning for next semester, like I'm working on a degree in the midst of everything. Yeah, that sounds like you're doing so. a lot. I know that you can. Um, next week we have All About Eve. A classic. My favorites. Yeah. Two of you like that. Important. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful classic movie. I love that like even the the premise of it and like little notes of it have been like what the last eighty years of film <laughs> ever since the movie came out. They've just been like they reference it here and there throughout. It's just it's really cool. Even like Showgirls is kind of a modern take on it, which I found Look kind of interesting. It's gonna be a bumpy ride. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean that is from now Voyager, but excellent line read. <laughs> Well, you'll have to tell me how it goes. Okay. Well, I mean, and you can always watch the playback. You can be one of the eight people that watch us. <laughs> one of these days. I'll be in the movie theater. She means another time, okay. not necessarily yeah. live. <laughs> exactly. The, the next day. Yeah. The day after. Okay. But I don't know. I think we might actually wrap discussion. Unless, Are you guys going to stay and talk? I know Morgan's got a dip and I'll probably bounce. But No, it seems like it's good to wrap it. Like there's things I thought about when I was reading it compared to the movie when I, earlier today. And then as we read it, I have thoughts. I didn't write them down, so they're all gone. <laughs> no, it's a, it's been a good read and it we did really very good. well. We did very early considering there were so few of us and it was such a long script. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it flew by like as quick, if not quicker than lots of our other scripts that are fewer pages. So great Versus job. my breakneck reading speed, I don't doubt that was probably something. When no, I it, it. it was perfect. It was good. <laughs> watch you'll listen back and go oh it wasn't as crazy fast as i thought it would like it was a good speed okay um yeah all right well thank you guys i do think it was a great read and great table read and the movie is great so have a good week and we see you guys on next week watch out for that collateral damage out there yeah take care <laughs> yes good night good night